<laughs> All right. <laughs> Call to order the Town of Mount Desert Planning Board meeting for August 9th, 2023. Welcome aboard. So we are still in hybrid territory here, obviously, with planning board meetings. We've got uh, Zoom um, online here and obviously everybody in the room tonight. And I'll just go through and <clears throat> make introductions, give a little Zoom protocol spiel, and we'll get right on our way. So um, first off, I'm William Hanley. I'm chair. We've got Tracy Loftus Keller. We've got Meredith Randolph. And we've got Dave Ashmore online. Dave, can you hear us? Yes. <laughs> Good to see you. So a couple things for everybody on Zoom, just uh, where our recording secretary isn't here tonight. If everybody on Zoom could go into chat and sign in, please, just so we have a record of everybody online, even though we're recording it. And then uh, just the other thing too, if you're, if you are on Zoom, just keep your mic off, you know, until, um, you know, if there's any comment given from Zoom, then we'll just keep an eye out and um, call your name and get comment from you, but keep your mic off, please. And then to just with chat, chat's just for sign in. No big, no side discussions or anything like that. Let's just keep it clean and let's keep it in the in the public forum. So, and raise your hand. And raise your hand. We're we're watch, There's a lot of people on Zoom tonight. I can't. Thirty four. So, um, you know, if we'll we'll watch for you if your hand have your hands up and there's that little hands up icon too. So, the muting themselves because there's several people who are yeah <laughs> thanks and i should also make the introduction of andrew Ham hamilton he's town council joining us tonight and uh, we've got kim keen here as well our code enforcement officer uh so just checking on zoom there everybody's almost got their mic turned off can't get started <laughs> yeah there you go it's looking good. The so everybody got the message. Turn your mic off. Yeah. iPhone five six one. Can you turn your mic off, please? Just mute yourself and let's let's get going. So the um, first item of the. Uh, tonight was I, you know, given the um, the potential length of the um, third item on the agenda tonight, the um, the subdivision application with MD three sixty five, I made the suggestion to the board that we take the agenda out of order, where we've got a sketch plan review after that for another subdivision sketch plan review is pretty straightforward. I think it's going to be fairly quick for this application. And also, uh, we have a potential planning board applicant here tonight. And I'd also make the pitch for the planning board. We have vacancies on the planning board. So if anybody has any interest in being on the planning board, please contact the town office. So um, I wanted to just, for the record, first consult um, the first applicant uh, tonight on the agenda to see if that's okay to take things out of order. That's fine. All yep. right. And then, thanks. And then, uh, guys, I think we need a motion to. I'll make a motion to take the uh, meeting minutes out of order. We still need to do meeting minutes first, yeah. but then uh, make the third item of the agenda the. Um, pre-approval of the subdivision in on Tom Sound. Yeah. And the meet and greet. Mm -hmm. And the meet and greet. Yeah. Oh yes. So Dave Ashmore second. There you go. 
All right, all those in favor, Meredith? Here, you must Hi. be muted. Dave. Dave Ashmore. I yes. <laughs> Tracy. Tracy Keller, I. And myself, I. All right, so and we're keeping our mics off, right? Yes, my dear. Out there in Zoom land. Zoom meeting is taking place at the town hall. Yeah. Sure. Ariana, or if I'm saying that correctly, could you please turn your mic off? It's, I'm sure it's, I, I opted not to go. So Ariane Wellen. Clearly, you opted not to go. <laughs> can we? we yeah. We can mute people. people. Yeah. 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 Mastering yeah. Hosting. Technology. You want to mute her, please, Kim, or ask her to mute. All right, so we've got, um, so let's roll through the adjusted agenda here. Item number two, we have a approval of minutes. We've got the minutes from June 14th mm -hmm. to approve. Okay, uh, Tracy Keller, I make a motion to approve the meeting minutes from June 14th as um, presented. Meredith Randolph, I second them. All right, all those in favor, Tracy. Tracy Keller, aye. Meredith. Randolph, aye. Dave. Dave Ashmore, aye. Myself, William Hanley, aye. All right. Let's keep going. So item three tonight, we have subdivision approval applications. And we're gonna first look at subdivision 004, 2023. Owner name is Soam Sound Subdivision LLC, Michael Ho. Location is off Sergeant Brook Road, Mount Desert, tax map eight, lots 039 through 004. Zoning district is red sign for one and rural woodland two. The purpose is modifications to a previously approved and reported subdivision. It's Amendment number one of the Soam Sound subdivision, file 33, numbers 146, And we have an underground utilities plan. We had a site visit today at 4.30. And Kim, we're... Was this, this was advertised in the newspaper? Say it again. It was advertised. It was advertised in the newspaper. Yeah. Um, I'm not seeing. I'm sure we'll figure out which at newspaper it was advertised in and when. Maybe. And how about a butter notification? No, butter. Okay. Say that again. Just notification of paper. Yeah. Um, I don't see the, it doesn't appear to be in the file here. Listen. Missing something. So we'll figure out when it was in the paper and in the spirit of moving things along, we had a site visit at 4.30 yep. and Tracy, would you care to report your observations yes, from the site I visit? Would. Um, Bill and I met with uh, Michael Ho uh, at the site and uh, he showed us um, um, markers indicating where the proposed subdivision would be and um, provided us with, um, and we have many maps, but I have a little bit of a revised map that shows some soil test pit locations. Um, uh, it is a lot four of the original subdivision plan that's being uh, subdivided into uh, basically a rectangle and a triangle. Um, and um, the uh, rectangle is uphill from the triangle, um, and will the larger larger parcel that's the rectangle 
uh, we'll have a uh, in the future um, a, a pretty regular sized home on it. Uh, and the and the um, provision is that the smaller parcel will have a smaller home, potentially um, something like a garage with an apartment above it. Um, Michael showed us all of the um, utilities that are there in place. Um, that whole subdivision has utility um, utilities sort of running throughout, but. Um, these two lots um, have everything kind of in place underground already. Um, and um, the septic, everything everything is sort of all situated. So um, I don't know, would you like to add anything? Yeah, so it's essentially a larger lot that's being split into two. And the curious thing about it is that the division line is right where the rural woodland two and um, residential one district bisects the lot. So you end up having the larger lot divided into a 2.5 acre lot and a smaller lot to, um, broken off to 1.3 acres. And is there any conflict of interest on the board at all? None heard. And then I'll turn it over to Michael. Um, yeah, so I'd like to amend the Song Sound subdivision and do the slot division. Um, as I walk you guys down and explain everything about the utilities and all the setbacks that been looked at, Bill did the soil test pits and just waiting for his report back. Um, but he didn't find good dirt. So we do have a location for another septic system down there. Um, the other lot, and which is just uphill, um, that septic system is already in. and. There's plenty of room there from where I want to put that slab that house to the lot line that I'm proposing. So it's about 65 feet back. And um, open to any questions if anybody has any questions about it. Yeah, so here we are in the in a subdivision review process again, and this one's a, a land division uh, where we're creating a new lot in a subdivision. And the first step in the subdivision review process, I think some of us to be pretty familiar with now, is sketch plan review. And sketch plan review is really just the informal introduction of the amendment change or new new land division. So here we are. If you have any questions about the application, feel free to ask away. I have questions. Yeah. Um, I presume that these are both, you're saying that they're, that the rural woodlands requires two acres and the so the other division requires right. one acre. That's so right. yet they're adequately sized. Mm -hmm. um, and then it looks like on the subdivision map, like there's maybe a stream and there's a bridge indicated. Yeah. That's isn't down here. Is that one of those streams of concern? Sergeant's Brook is the stream you're speaking of. Yes. Yeah. The bridge that goes over right there, and that runs at the very foot of the property. And uh the area that we'd be working on is uh, significantly up hills. But from uh, streams are, have enormous setbacks. Well, they do. Or they do. If, the... if you look at the photo right there where it says bridge on the top yeah. there, uh, that survey right there is where the bridge is, where that triangular comes down to the point. Mm -hmm. um, the soil test sites were up by the R1 and R2 line. And yeah. marked on the survey there. Mm -hmm. And pink, I think, on yours. Mm -hmm. the, the house spot that we walked around and looked at is about 65 feet back in that line in the center of that triangle, far away from the road. So there's there's space built. I would I think we'll set as well. Yeah. 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 Not just space. Good question. Mm -hmm. Just along those notes, there is an additional wetland as well, though, that's kind of closer to the, I believe, crazy of your property. Mm -hmm. Another wetland area there near one of the markers, um, mm -hmm. which will be the lot line in the future. And we did our 75 foot setback as well from there to determine that the septic system will fit in and also leave us enough room for a small garage apartment house. Wetlands there. 
<laughs> there's the here. It's like the lot division line is just it's almost exactly the well it is yeah, exactly right on the R1 line. Yeah. That's convenient. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're just saying it's all there and yeah, it's you know, sketch plan is just the the informal introduction of the project. Yeah. Tom Benson of South West Harbor is finishing up a final survey to determine the exact length of that R121 proposed slot line that I was talking about. I think it's about 415 feet. Um, and he has a little desk work to do. He's done all the field work and he's going to try to get that you know, at least the next couple of weeks to me. Yeah, and the next one will do the completion. So whether he has all the Yeah, then we the drill next. down through 421, 422, 423, and make sure it's all there. We find it complete, and then we have the public hearing, and then we do a final compliance review. Okay, no, any other comments, questions? Thoughts? All right, well, that I think concludes the sketch plan review. I got the advertising. <laughs> oh, good. good. Yay. July 27th, it was in the El North American and Mount Desert Island. I'm going to put it in my original package. Great, thanks. Hold on to your application because we'll. Be continually referring to that through the process. And thanks, Mike. All set, Bill. I can move forward with the application. It sounds like we're all set. All right. Oh, come on, Steve. No. <laughs> all right. So then, taking things out of order, but. In the spirit of moving on, we have item four tonight. We have a meet and greet potential planning board alternate member. And is Alan Kimmerly here by any chance? Right here. Hi, Alan. Hi. Welcome to the party. <laughs> Thank you. So um, we've got your application before the board. I'm just going to uh, read through a couple things and then um, love to hear from you too. And, uh, your interests in the board. So, uh, Alan, um, actually, I'll just let you talk. How about that? And, the, you know, so on the check on your application here, it first asks if you've served on any other boards and, or committees in the town of Mount Desert. Yes, I'm uh, currently on the Harbor Committee and the Lusso Committee and Warren Committee. Right. We had a whole plate there. Um, <laughs> I don't, uh, I'm retired now. <laughs> I dabble a few things. All right. Well, I have time and I give, I'd like to uh, give it back to the town. Fantastic. <laughs> All right. Are there any uh, background experiences or skills you feel would contribute to this appointment? I've dabbled in uh, applications with town governments getting things done and I've built some things myself. Mm -hmm. So I have a very, very minor idea of what I may be stepping into. <laughs> well, great. You're probably going to get to know the land use ordinance really well. But just for everybody's information, you don't have to have any prior experience. No. Nope. <laughs> Anybody else who'd like to join, you don't need to have any background. And uh, your next question was, uh, why are you interested in the appointment? Uh, like I stated, I want to uh, get back to the town. Now that I have time and an opportunity to do that. Well, we've got a fantastic town to give back to. Um, what are your goals for the board or committee? Well, I would say that, uh, you know, the one thing is I want the town to stay the way it is, but I also understand that we have to move forward and do things that sometimes, you know, we may not think are you know, what we want, but we may need to do to keep our town current. It's a delicate dance. At One of the things I want our town to stay a town mm -hmm. and keep having people live here. 
hopefully all the time like I do. Great. Do you have any conflicts with meeting times or group assignments? Not, not that I can think of. Yeah, we're usually meeting every other twice a month, second, fourth Wednesdays of the month. I believe my other many assignments are usually Tuesdays. Yeah. We don't conflict with the other. No. And they committees. usually before six. Yeah. I'm not sure if the one committee conflicts with that. Well, great. I mean, it's been a, quite a while since we've had a potential applicant to the planning board. Loved seeing the application before us. And uh, I mentioned two questions you might want to pose. Absolutely. Uh, one question is Does the applicant agree to uphold the Constitution of Maine and of the United States? That's the first question. Well, I never agreed to that. And then the second question is, do you agree that irrespective of your feelings about an application, your job is to apply the plain text of the ordinances to, to the application? So I think your first question technically gets answered if he's sworn in. Yes, yeah. I yeah. previously sworn in. Mm -hmm. I bet he's already answered that question. Yeah. yeah. And how about Andrew's second question? And what was that again? So irrespective of your feelings for good or for bad about an application, do you agree that your duty is to apply the standards in the ordinance and only the standards in the ordinance? Uh, absolutely. Well, I'd love to hear a recommendation from somebody to, um, or a motion to make the recommendation to the Board of Selectmen to consider Alan for the planning board. I'll try. <laughs> I will make a recommendation to the Board of Selectmen. A motion. Motion um, to for the Board of Selectmen to consider Alan Kimberly uh, for uh, membership as a planning board. I'll second that. Um, alternate. So, so um, some discussion. Yeah. So right now we are deficient one full-time member on the board. So what that would likely entail is if we only have four sitting members of the board and you're an alternate member, we're probably going to be making a motion to vote you on <laughs> as a voting member of the board for each hearing. So but let's give him two or three meetings and then yeah. he can think he's an alternate. That will still be. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, and, and the way that process works is even if you were de designated as an alternate, mm -hmm. if the board, as the chair says, is shy a member that evening, the alternate steps into the position of being a regular board member mm -hmm. for purposes of action on the applications on that meeting. Yeah. Then if sometime later another board member is appointed that wants to be a regular member, um, that individual is here. But I agree with Mary's sense. Um, I think if you grow into the position, you probably grow into the position. Oh, of course. It doesn't matter where you start, it's where you end up. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, a, a, the full board is a five member voting board with two alternates. Yeah, ideally. <laughs> All right, so we had a motion, we had a second, a little bit of discussion. All those in favor? Tracy? Tracy Keller, aye. Meredith? Randolph, aye. Dave? Dave Ashmore, aye. Myself, William Manley, I. Congratulations. We'll make a recommendation to the Board of Selectmen. And if you want to stick around for the fun, please do. <laughs> I, I will. All right. <laughs> Let me advise towards one side or the other of any. <laughs> <laughs> Will they be an alternate or a member today? So the Board of Selectmen has to technically vote him, make the recommendation and approve him. On, so today he's not. He's not anything. He's not on the board. He's not He cannot post anything. Public meeting. Don't give somebody. Show this for me. Hey, guys.
Okay. Make, make your well, comment. Term, if somebody just took our well, it's taking a photograph. Yeah. Well, somebody who objected by taking yeah. a photograph. Of me. Right, I had a public meeting. Uh, I'm going to take as many photographs as I, as I can. And some gentleman came and grabbed me on the shoulder and he ran off with my phone. And he yeah, sure. He he so, so guys, so guys, it's a you know, sideshow. Yeah, guys, we got to maintain order here. You know, so. she, um, it's inappropriate to you mean, but it's a public meeting. It doesn't matter. You don't it's just the thing. Okay. Okay. Uh, he ran off the <laughs> shoe. I think you were okay. I think you were in that special way. I apologize. But you know what? This is a public meeting. I'm going to take a photograph. So, guys, we got to maintain order here. And if he, he ran off my phone, which is my can, library, can you give him his so phone back, sir? In the order. In the order. In the what? Okay. Like his phone but ask the council. This is the yes. council. May I take as many photos as I want? And, and do you have the right to stick your finger at people? Yes. Are you so, know, you so just, guys, what are you we're saying? out of. So wait, wait. Could, could I ask that everybody listen to the chair as he tries to maintain order of this meeting and the focus of the meeting? We're getting into something that is an aside. To the business of yeah, the he hit me and he grabbed my hand. Uh, oh, he did. He did. He did. He did. He grabbed my hand. He grabbed my Wow. Wow. We, we don't need this. Could, 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 could you take it outside if you need to yeah. talk? Yeah, yeah, please just take it outside. This is disruptive of the meeting. Of course, it's disruptive, but she started it. <laughs> so, so, listen, I'm here as a reporter. I'm going to take as many photographs as I want. I'm going to record the entire session. And she tries to stop me, I'm going to object. Okay. You need now, to... Mr. Council, do I have the right to do that? We have the right to comply with the um, uh, order of the chair who's trying to conduct a meeting with this planning board. Um, what you have the right to do, you you can determine your rights, uh, Mr. Milstein. You know your rights. And 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 I would say if you've got a discussion you need to have with a gentleman that took your phone. Take it outside and then come back. <laughs> he took my phone. He, he seized it. And he, I don't even know where it is. Well, uh, yeah, yes. I, I was looking that way at the time. And the gentleman was complaining about his phone. Put his finger at the phone there. And that's what the other gentleman stood up and took it. Took it on the I think you need to know that in the context of. Well, this is all so, not germane to the subject of the meeting. Well, it really is. So I would just ask the gentleman who may have taken the phone and the gentleman who owns the phone to take it outside and get the phone back into the owner of the phone's hands and let him um, just conduct himself in accord with the chairman's instructions. This is becoming more of a distraction than is needed tonight. So please, let's maintain order and let's move forward. Let's make it clear. I'm going to take a photograph of everything that's happening inside. You're not uncomfortable with it. That's fine. Okay. If you, are you going to give everybody the finger constantly as well? Yeah. I don't if think it's going to be right. They try to obstruct my... You're, very, you're being very disruptive. But, but, but if you're being disruptive, the chair is going to ask you to leave. This so it all, the whole thing started when she... If you're, being, if you're being disruptive... In the public meeting, the, ch the chair is going to ask you to leave. And if you don't comply with the chair, the chair is authorized to go down and get an officer and have you escorted out. There's, there's, there's already some activity that requires that you maintain order. So let's let ask a constable to come into this meeting and then get public meeting. Great, you should arrest people. No, no, you're not going to arrest anybody. But if your phone, if your phone, Mr. Milton. Mr. Milton, if your phone has been taken, it needs to be returned to you. I'll make sure the constable makes sure it's returned. And we are going to maintain order for this meeting consistent with the chairman's request. Okay? So, I just have a quick question. What is the phone policy so we can get that out? So the, and then proceed with Yeah, so typically, so that's a good question. So we've got several electronic recording devices here. We've got a We've got it just a, a digital recorder running here, and then we've got the owl recording everything online. And what often happens when cell phones are on in here is it will interfere with the digital recording. Right? 
And uh, commonly over the, in the past, we've been asking cell phones to be turned off or put into airplane mode. But what, what's been happening um, last couple of years is that the, we've been relying on the owl more because the owl's recording the, the, kind of the meeting as well. Um, you know, I, it's good policy to put your phone in airplane mode in a public meeting. I would think that doesn't even need to be said in this day and age. So two things. Just, yeah, here, here's the procedure for tonight. I'm glad you asked. So the gentleman that took the phone is going to return the phone to, to its owner. That's number one. Number two is... I think you should consider whether you need to take a picture of everything that happens during the meeting. There's an actual video recording of this meeting that actually records everything. So just don't use your phone as an instrument. Of, of you may interrupt everybody. I'm Officer Mike Allen. I'm also one of full-time dispatchers. Where is Mr. Milstein's phone, please? Uh, I will give it to you. What's your name? Here. Uh, what I'd like to say is that what I really happened, because I was right here and I was right ever since. Mr. Reporter, Mr. Reporter, you took a picture. Well, you took my phone. All right, I'll be back. You took your phone. You were very aggressive, and you took your finger out. Okay. Hey, we still have to take photographs. You know, everything because I prefer my angle than what is on video. I, I, so I hate to be disruptive. You know, can we just? You're not, you're not going to be further disruptive. Because I'm going to shut this down right now and return to a planning board meeting. Please. So, so please don't don't disrupt any further. Okay. You got somebody else. Anybody removed? Lincoln. Remove it. Folks, I'm asking that yeah. you tag on a minute. Lincoln, I'm gonna get, I'm only gonna say this once. We're gonna maintain order in here. Everybody, if you have something to say and it's relative to the subject matter that we're that the board is deliberating, you're gonna raise your hand and you're gonna speak when you're called upon, and you're not gonna speak bef before the chair recognizes you. And if you're disrupted in here by any means, you're gonna be removed. Okay. I'm just gonna that, are you raising your hand? I'm going to take photographs. Okay. No. 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 no, no, no. Please rule on that. I'm going to take photographs. I have to, you know, Lincoln, this Please is, you're creating new territory here. And no. Made, no. You, you are. Lincoln, no one, no one has ever been in here taking photographs. Yes, and I and I don't understand why you're doing that when everything's being recorded. Because I want a different angle. Because your recording can, are not that good. So let me let me get a legal opinion here. On so that. what I've typically seen, Lincoln, is a reporter will take a single photo of the of the meeting room, and that's about all they do. They don't take a photo of everything. So let's just use a little bit of common sense. And settle down, and let's get on with it. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'm good. Yeah. Ma'am. But I would like a photo policy tonight because I think we're going to keep getting into this situation. Yeah. So if we get into this situation one more time, we're going to have a conversation with the constable again, and we will restore order. So I hope there isn't a lot of further behavior in this regard. There doesn't need to be. So let's just focus on the topic at hand which is a review of an application. And as I asked the gentleman who's seeking to be an applicant to the planning board, do you agree that regardless of your feelings about anything, the job of the planning board is to apply the standards of the ordinance to the application. So there should be two things discussed tonight, application and standards, nothing else. That, that, agreed. That agreed, we're we're in final compliance review of the application and it's time for the boards, time for the board to talk. Yeah. So, so let's let's get back on track now. Let me introduce the application we're reviewing now, and keep rolling rolling yeah. ahead. I've got a few preliminary comments, but you should go first. Yeah. Let me make the introduction, Andrew, and then uh, we'll get to it. So, okay. Skipping back now on the adjusted um, agenda, we're on item three, subdivision approval application. And this is continued from June 14th, 2023. We have a public hearing at uh, 605, but obviously that's been adjusted now. And this is subdivision 002, 2023, 
Owner name is Mount Desert 365. Agent is Greg Johnston, GF Johnson and Associates. Location five Manchester Road, Northeast. He continues, he continues to put the camera in on that safe. Four times. This is not necessary. It is uncalled for. It started because he lit somebody off. Now they keep shooting pictures in our face. Come on. This is a meeting about a topic, not a photo essay. Let me, uh, uh, this is being disruptive. Let me take a minute with the constable, yeah. Mr. Nelson. Okay, come on. Thank you, sir. So I have a conversation with you. So I'm all this. Lincoln, you've got, Lincoln, you've got to go with him. Go back to me, Mark. Okay, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, can we continue now? Please. Please. So, location is by Manchester Road, Northeast Harbor, tax map 23, lot 25, zoning district, village residential one. And the purpose we have subdivision as defined is the construction or placement of three or more dwelling units on a single tract or parcel of land within a five year period. The proposal is the construction or placement of six dwelling units on a single tract or parcel of land within a five year period. And it's for workforce housing. And tonight we are at the compliance review process of the set subdivision application process. We've gone through sketch plan. Sketch plan again is just the informal introduction of the project where we allow public comment, questions, thoughts, whatever. Uh, and then the board uh, moves into completeness review. We found uh, where we drill down through sections 421, 422, 423 of the subdivision ordinance and make sure that the application is complete before the board. Uh, the board found that the application was complete. And then after that, we had at the last hearing, uh, we had the public hearing. Public hearing is as it states, it's where the public comments on the on the application. We uh, entertained public comment for the majority of that night. We uh, arrived at a point where there was no more public comment and we closed the public hearing. So now we're at the final step of the four step process. We're in the compliance review. And this is where the board really digs into the application and 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 what we're doing is we're looking that is it's in, in compliance with section five of the subdivision ordinance. It's in compliance with section six of the land use ordinance. And then also Andy will probably talk about this too. There's another compliance um, criteria identified in the subdivision ordinance. It's title 30-A section 4404. Uh, and it's and it echoes a lot of what's already being reviewed in the subdivision ordinance where you know we're looking at a lot of environmental compliance concerns so here we are and where Andy's outside dealing with that why don't I turn it over to the applicant to make any make an introduction sure um Mr. Chairman, my name is Greg Johnson. I'm an engineer and representative of uh, the African. With me is Kathy Miller, the executive director of MB365. So you're probably going to have to speak Can up. You stand up sure. yeah, a little sure. there because the owl's not. Yeah, that's sure. Right. <laughs> and, and that's another thing, too. If, if, if there is any comment tonight, just try to project your voice. The owl had struggles to pick up commentary from the back of the room. Uh, if you do, um, if you are called on to speak, please come up to the podium and do so. And it's just that much cleaner in the recording. So thank you. Yep. Um, so we're here for um, since the um, completeness was final submittal, we provide you a final submittal. I won't go that in detail. Um, I'm going to brief that um, just so we understand what was in there. Um, the final plan, which is required. Um, Noted locations of implementation. Basically, the plan you've um, been reviewing has to be deemed the final plan. Um, we also submitted a landscape and buffering plan, had a typo on it where they had a limited common element, which isn't a term for landscaping plan. That is in your package as well. Um, we had been talking many times about um, open space 
what's available. The, the ordinance actually determines open space as outdoor passive space. Um, there's been a lot of talk of that, what's there, how it's measured, but we provide an exhibit on what that outdoor passive space is. Uh, that passive space is more than 50% of the lot. Um, we'll note um, other questions or wrap surrounding the affordability covenants were provided uh, by the applicant. Um, declaration of condominiums and further background on the um, um, density calculation. Uh, other exhibits that were just noted, all of the prior submittal applications from the March exhibits should carry forward by reference to the final submission package. Those are part of our final um, application. Um, I'm going to have a brief uh, statement, and then I, I'd like to introduce um, Dan Plaguey of Kitty of Law as their counsel may have a few comments. Um, first, I just wanted to implore the board tonight to use the tools of the ordinance. You guys have worked with building the ordinance, um, but didn't write it. It went to the people or it went to the select board and the people to vote. And I think if you look at the ordinance um, and the tools that you'll find that in the compatibility of the district as a whole um, that meets the ordinance. But um, we thank you for your time tonight and in the past. And that Dan, if you'd like to say a few words. Good evening, everybody, members of the board. Um, I thought I was only allowed to talk about granite and it's <laughs> kind of refreshing. Um, but thank you. Um, I appreciate everything you're doing. I appreciate your attention to the ordinance. I just want to talk um, briefly about some of the issues that have, uh, that have come up as part of the um, uh, tonight, uh, surprisingly, and have come up previously um, in connection with this. Land use regulation, as you guys know, you're an experienced board, is a um, series of voter approved uses and restrictions on uses of land in the community. Loud, loud. Yeah. <laughs> your ordinance and your guidelines and your standards apply to everybody and they apply equal. The standards are designed to avoid votes that are based upon emotion and feelings sentiments about uh, things not uh, not being developed in uh, proximity to our own properties, things that might get us off track and, and lead the town to treat people differently or arbitrarily. You guys as a municipal board are given the authority by your voters to apply the ordinance words to every application. That's it. Um, you don't have discretion to apply formulas or feelings that don't appear in the ordinance to any land use application. With that in mind, it applies to every category that you're going to review, but with that in mind, I just want to talk about a couple different areas. I want to talk about um, lot size density and open space in the village residential one zoning district. Your land use ordinance section 3.5 says that a minimum lot size for a, a property attached to municipal sewer or municipal sewer is available like this one has a minimum lot size of 10,000 feet. Um, you can put on any single lot, you can put one single family dwelling or one two family dwelling and an accessory dwelling. <coughs> That has obviously um, you know, sleeping accommodations. Now that's different than um, than dwelling units. The ordinance defines dwelling units, and it talks about single and two family dwellings. The property contains over thirty nine thousand square feet. It's almost over the uh, the limit for uh, for four lots, but well over the limit for three lots. In a conventional subdivision that could include a two family dwelling and a single family accessory dwelling. Three lots, two unit, uh, two dwellings, units, we get six, right? We get six uh, dwelling units on a conventional subdivision. Here we have one lot, um, but you have the same formula that applies. Subdivision Ordinance Section 5.7 says that there's a specific formula 
that you use to determine overall lot density. And it's the only formula that you can use. And you apply the total number of proposed dwelling units, six, compared to the total acreage, including open spaces and recreational areas, 39,204. Without any reduction, without any reduction for workforce housing, mm -hmm. this property supports six dwelling units. That's in any combination, but three, two family dwellings and three accessory dwellings. Um, although subdivision ordinance 5.16.2.2 allows us a density bonus because we're proposing workforce housing, we're not applying that bonus here. We don't need it. It doesn't gain us uh, really, really uh, anything. So without addressing density bonuses, there's enough space on this property to support the use that we're asking you to approve. Why is that important? Because we're not asking for a minimum lot size reduction. Your open space requirement, subdivision um, ordinance 15.6.2.3 uh, allows you guys to mandate open space only to the extent by which building lots are reduced below minimum size in the BR1 district. Open space is pleasant, it's nice, you can't mandate, and the ordinance doesn't allow you to mandate open space here where we're not asking for a reduction in lot size. Workforce housing has uh, no open space requirement that can be imposed here on the order. We have plenty, we tried to show you on our, um, on our graphics that there's plenty of passive recreational area uh, surrounding these proposed units for people to recreate, play, to um, enjoy the outdoors. That is different from the requirements of section 15.6.2. The words of the ordinance are the only standards that you can apply. <clears throat> I understand the um, letters that we've gotten. I understand the comments that I've heard through the, uh, the public hearing process. Um, I understand the, the uh, residents' concerns, but this application fits very neatly within the VR1 zoning district within workforce housing. Um, it meets the ordinance requirements of Clinton, both the land use ordinance and the subdivision ordinance. And it's designed to do that. It's not designed to take advantage of anything. It's designed to fit in exactly what the voters of this town have approved. And thank you for giving us your attention. Thank you for applying the ordinance words to the application. I know you will, um, but I appreciate it. Thanks, Dan. Can we open a window? Uh, yeah, can we turn the here. no questions yet? <laughs> the let's let's get the AC on <laughs> first. And um Andy, to... just where you had to step out there briefly, could you um I know you had a few introductory introductory items you wanted to mention. Yeah, I can do it now or I can get it once the board hears from um, both uh, the applicants council and the council for interested persons. I think that may be more appropriate if I defer until after okay. um, uh, Mr. Burns has a chance to address the board uh, because my comments really go to where are you in this process mm -hmm. and what do you have before you as an assignment for tonight? Got it. Which I think takes a lot of the clutter out of the room and reduces it to a fairly clear path, but it's perhaps appropriate and, and fundamentally fair to have counsel for the interested parties be able to speak. Um, and uh, so I'll, I'll defer to you all. Is, I just, can I just say, I feel like I need more oxygen and I don't want to start getting sick. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the air conditioner is not going to give us yeah, fresh Yeah, can we air. open yeah. some windows? Turn on the AC. Yeah, turn the AC on. Well, Kim didn't turn the AC on, but I just think there needs to be more air exchange. We're Absolutely. going to get some stress. <laughs> <laughs> don't talk louder. Really Absolutely. 
So you're on. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Loud. I will do my utmost <laughs> best to project my dulcet baritone here. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board, uh, my name is Brady Burns, an attorney for a uh, number of butters here, including Stuart Janney, uh, Lynn Wheat, uh, Joseph Ryerson, and uh, Lamont Harris. Um, I've spoke to you uh, already, um, and I've submitted several uh, documents to you. Um, uh, attorney Pelagi is here uh, and has provided some uh, additional argument as to why, uh, in the applicant's view, uh, this application comports with uh, your ordinances. Um, I will uh, try to uh, be as brief as I can um, in, in discussing uh, uh, what our perspective is uh, on those ordinances. Uh, I think any anyone here, certainly any attorney here, will agree that you are bound to uh, look at the ordinance provisions as they are, to apply those provisions in a fair-handed way, um, and to not make things up if you go along. That is, uh, you know, that, that's fundamentally your job. And I think everyone here agrees with that. Uh, I will note uh, that both the uh, substantive provisions of the LUZO in 6A.1 as well as the substantive provisions of the subdivision ordinance include as uh, substantive review criteria, uh, review of the compatibility of any project to the surrounding area. Uh, LUZO lays out specific criteria that you are supposed to evaluate that compatibility on, um, but uh, that is indeed something that you are required to examine as part of this application. It's uh, contained within the four corners of the ordinance. Um, at their best, attorneys uh, help to clarify. I think at their worst, they add confusion. Um, I think everyone here is trying to provide some clarity to uh, to these ordinances uh, and help you in guiding uh, your own deliberation. Um, unfortunately, uh, I think confusion is the, the general rule that's prevailed right now. Um, I'm confused. Uh, Attorney Pleggy's uh, uh, letter in response to my own um, appears to include a uh, an interpretation of your ordinance that uh, is actually different than what was provided uh, as part of the applicant's initial packet. Um, it appears that the applicant is now saying that uh, no density bonus is required here in order to get um, the required uh, number of units onto this lot. That was news to me when I read the letter. Uh, my understanding throughout was that the uh, the applicant had taken a position that, uh, from the applicant's own uh, view, 3.9 units would be allowed uh, on this, this lot, uh, and that the density bonus would kick that up to 6.8. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, that math um, that the applicant has provided um, and why it uh, rounding up here is uh, both unnecessary and, and frankly not allowed by your opinion. Um, so I think all parties here agree that the subdivision standards apply here. Um, this is obviously a subdivision. Um, and so you're looking at both the LUZO and the subdivision ordinances you undertake your review. Uh, the subdivision uh, ordinance, um, as Attorney Blegge noted, requires that an applicable net density be determined by, quote, the total number of proposed dwelling units and the total acreage within the subdivision. So. We have our numerator and we have our denominator when we're talking about the number of units allowed in the subdivision. Total units divided by uh, total acreage within the subdivision. It then directs us to section 3.5 of the LUZO, which gives us the minimum lot size of 10,000. Now, the applicants themselves included this map in their initial uh, application materials to you. You'll recall. Uh, in the first section uh, of uh, their initial application, they included um, in two different places um, a, a breakdown of this map. Uh, in the letter I sent to you, I included uh, my own discussion of that map here. Uh, according to the applicant, uh, the way that we need to come to the allowed number of units uh, here is to take the Total uh, lot size of the lot, which the applicants assert is around 39,000 square feet. We have indicated our view that the, the total amount we should be measuring is actually less because of the right of way that is attached to this property. But let's use 39,000 here for the sake of consistency. Uh, according to the applicant, you take the 39, you divide it by 10,000, that gets you 3.9. Uh, from there, uh, you multiply the 
uh, 39,000 by 0.75, that gives you about 29,400 square feet. Uh, divide that by 10,000, that gives you 2.9 units. You add those together, that's 6.8 units. Now, the problem with that math fundamentally is that you cannot have a fraction of a unit on a lot. So when we talk about the density of the original lot, what we 39,000 might as well be 30,000 because ultimately that 0.9 should not be used to increase the density bonus when that unit would not actually be allowed on the project. Uh, Attorney Pelegi noted that under the LUZO, um, any lot uh, can contain, you know, perhaps a one unit building, a two unit building, as well as uh, uh, accessory dwelling unit. If there are more than three units built, that would still trigger subdivision review. Um, but uh, in any event, what we're talking about here is a workforce subdivision. And under your subdivision ordinance, the way that you measure that lot density is established in the subdivision ordinance. And that is looking at a per, a per unit basis, right? So this discussion of duplexes versus uh, singles uh, is, is really not applicable to that because uh, as Attorney Pelagi said, section 5.7 gives you the formula that you're supposed to be applying here, which is, Number of dwelling units divided by minimum lot size. So, uh, excuse me, by total lot size. Then right? you apply the minimum lot size to that total. So, stripped of decimal points that aren't applicable here, what we're saying, what you have is an original lot that has uh, 39,000 square feet. The base density there then would be three units. You could fit three units in that 39,000 square feet. Three times 0.75 gets you uh, 2.25. So you have two additional units that are allowed there. Under that map, that would give you a maximum of five allowable units on that lot. The problem with rounding up is that it dramatically increases the power of the multiplier that the workforce development density bonus gives. Uh, and if you just uh, simply put, what we have here is a lot that would support uh, three units. And now we have one that supports six. That is a density bonus of 100% rather than 75. Um, that is not the intent of the ordinance. Um, you, in your record already, had materials from um, at least one individual who was part of the original drafting of these ordinances. Um, I attached some of those materials to the letter I sent to you uh, because these ordinance provisions are confused. Um, they don't talk to each other in a perfect way. Uh, but when we're looking at the intent of this ordinance, uh, it is uh, it is apparent that the intent here was not to allow a developer to uh, essentially double dip when it comes to these density provisions and use a fractional unit to then bolster uh, that ultimate density bonus because you end up with these uh, what is a strange situation where uh, you know seventy five percent of three becomes six uh, one point seven five becomes six so. Uh, the math here appears to be complicated. In my view, it's quite simple. 75% um, of three gives you two. That gives you five total units. The applicant here proposes six total units under your ordinances. That is uh, simply uh, too many. Um, so setting aside the additional issues that were raised in uh, my prior filings to you, uh, that is uh, a substantial issue that simply hasn't been addressed. And unfortunately, the applicant, rather than um, addressing that map directly, has provided uh, a completely different interpretation of the ordinance, one that uh, would create a situation in which the density bonus for workforce housing doesn't matter because you arrive at the same uh, amount of density whether you apply the bonus or not. That interpretation doesn't pass the straight face test. There would be no purpose to the density bonus if that were the result. Uh, so I would encourage you to apply your ordinances in a way that honors every component of those ordinances um, and to uh, look at these density provisions uh, as what they are. Uh, a, a, uh, uh, something that is intended to allow for flexibility within a development, uh, but does not, uh, allow for the complete uh, bending and breaking of the existing standard for any ordinance. Um, there has also been significant discussion around open space. Uh, I will not rehash the discussion that I've already been had regarding whether or not additional lots are created on this parcel, um, but I will simply note 
that uh, the fundamental purpose of the workforce development uh, regime is to allow for flexible development, creates and maintains open space. So uh, the applicant has provided you with an overview of uh, applicable open space that may be on the property. The ordinance is clear that when we talk about open space uh, as it relates to these workforce subdivisions, what we need is something that is legally set aside uh, that cannot be disturbed uh, and is maintained in perpetuity as open space. None of the passive space that uh, the applicant has described to you is uh, locked up in that way. So if you determine that any open space is required for this project, which I would argue that it certainly does, if they're using a workforce subdivision uh, provision, then they have included zero open space with this application. So uh, I hope that provides some clarity on uh, our position as to those two fundamental components of the workforce development uh, subdivision standards. Uh, I uh, wish you luck as you continue your substantive review. Um, and I would encourage you to look at the entire record, including those submissions that have already been provided to you. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that, now I think it'd be timely to offer some comments. Okay, go for it. So um, the board has conducted both sketch plan review and completeness review of this application over 426, 2023 and June 14, 2023. You did, Jack Dandy. you did something on June 14, 2023, that was required because once you make a completeness determination, which you did on June 14, 2023, you have 60 days under the subdivision ordinance, and for that matter, the main municipal subdivision law to render your decision. And if the applicant had uh, declined your kind invitation as a board to have some additional time so that you can give the applicant time to submit a final plan application and hold a public hearing and then render your final decision beyond 60 days, you would have a problem. We had a conundrum facing us on June 14, as you may remember. So for the benefit of the public, the applicant, the interested persons, and all members of the public were notified that we were taking up for both a determination of the completeness of the final plan submittal, a public hearing, and third, final decision review, which has three options, approve, approve with conditions, or done. You were gonna conduct your review of all of that on August 9, 2023. I thought that was a smart day. It, it turned out that my family decided to take a vacation this week. So I'm here for this evening to have a very orderly planning board meeting with the hopes that I can get back to my family and return to my vacation. <laughs> so, so I want to see if I can hope in, in keeping this brief and focused. I would say that the comments from the public have assisted in helping the planning board to understand the context for their review. Context ain't standards. Standards are standards. So I'm going to walk you through a few things in your subdivision ordinance that I think make this fairly straightforward for you tonight, because a lot of the work that had to be done has been done. There is a fair bit left to be done. But before we get into the public hearing comments, which can tend to be somewhat repetitive and somewhat redundant, I think you needed to have the exemplars from each of the two attorneys lay out two very different views. And I have to agree with attorney Burns, something changed between the last meeting and this meeting. The applicant's entitled to do that. They can say, hey, we took more of a common sense view of this application. And what I hear is something that is found in section 5.7.3 of your subdivision ordinance, which says you can determine whether you've got a cluster a workforce or a conventional subdivision. I read Mr. Plaguey's letter several times. I read Mr. Burns' letter several times. And I think there's a foundational question for the planning board, first to the applicant. And that is, do you want this reviewed as a conventional subdivision? Because if you do, I have to say, I find this community's efforts to advance workforce subdivisions to be in hugely important policy question. 
but how you do it is really important to get it clear and get it right. And I think there's some confusion within the ordinance. And if the applicant has decided to reduce the confusion <laughs> and make it a little bit easier for the board, I wanna hear more from the applicant's team as to whether this might be reviewed more as a conventional subdivision. If I read attorney Pelegi's letter correctly, specifically paragraph three on page three of his letter, he says the following, the application proposes development of one and two family dwellings on a single lot. And that's, that was the point I made last time. It doesn't matter how other people wanna characterize their application, the applicant gets to characterize this application. And as long as the definitions and standards of the ordinance accord with the applicant's approach to the subdivision, that's what you're reviewing. It's the application applying the standards and definitions in the ordinance. And the definition of lot, I think, fits with the, the beast that's been called roughly 39,000 square feet. That's a lot. We know from condominium plan, um, uh, plan development uh, practice that there are different ways to structure ownership that can all lead to the same conclusion that the applicant's bringing you to in their project, which is you can, you can take a single lot and create units for occupancy without creating separate lots. This is, as I have said several times, a developmental subdivision. This is raw, not a raw land division. They couldn't do this as a raw land division, in my humble opinion. They have to do it as a developmental subdivision. It still must be reviewed under state statute and section five standards in your subdivision ordinance. I will take issue with the suggestion that uh, attorney Burns made tonight that you have to go back and do over what you've already done, and that is review 6A, 6B, and 6C of the land use ordinance. I wanna take you to 4.2.4 for just a second to take us back to what you've already done. 4.2.4 of the subdivision ordinance says the following, information showing compliance with LUZO and subdivision ordinances. The applicant shall submit evidence to the board to show compliance. This is at the time of completeness review to show compliance with section five of this ordinance, section six of the LUZO. That's what you did back in June. I looked at the record that Kim had shared with me of her notes. They line up brilliantly with your reporting secretary's notes. And that is by four to zero vote as to every one of the gosh darn completeness review requirements, you found unanimously that the application met the standards, okay? So in my opinion, 6A, 6B, and 6C are done. And I say that because I was anticipating someone would say, compatibility, 6A1 has to be reviewed over again. Uh -uh. We had a discussion about um, compatibility. The board did its homework on that step. So moving on, now, once you've conducted your completeness review, you had to conduct that review under section 4.2.4 of the subdivision um, ordinance, which requires that the applicant present evidence to show compliance with sections 5, 6A, 6B, and 6C of the land use ordinance. Those provisions include 6A1 compatibility and standards that would test harmony with a comprehensive plan. Now, I've read case law of the Maine Law Court for years. The Maine Law Court is very clear about a foundational distinction between a comprehensive plan, which, which leads to the adoption or amendment of a land use ordinance and the land use ordinance. What the law court said in a case called Nestle Waters versus Town of Freiburg is the comprehensive plan is just that, it's a plan the board is obligated to apply standards. And they said the ordinance provides the regulatory teeth. That means that when you're chewing on an application, you use the regulatory teeth. You don't use the plan, you use the standards of the ordinances. You've already done your section six A, B and C review. And I asked Ken before uh, we started tonight and I, I asked as a procedural matter, Chairman Hanley, do you believe you've done a completeness review under 4.2.4. They both said yes. I would ask the full board, do you believe consistent with the minutes of the, the April meeting 
um, that you completed your complete review. Anybody have a different view of that? Can we have a little discussion about that? Please, that's important. So just back to your statement where you, you know, we're, again, we're looking at 424 in a subdivision ordinance review. And again, that's information showing compliance and losing. So, yeah, sorry. <clears throat> So I'm referring to 424 in the subdivision ordinance, and that's where it's talking about information showing compliance with Luzo and subdivision ordinance. You know, when when we're we drilled through this in uh, in the context of completeness, completeness, making sure that the application before us um, has submitted information relative to the review criteria of 421, 422, 423, um, section um, five of the ordinance and section six of the LUZO. I don't see how how we address compliance in that process. Okay. We were, so it, here, here's what I need to wait do. Wait a second. We were, you know, my understanding yep. was and the board can chime in here too, is that essentially we're just drilling down for a checklist and making sure that the information is complete enough for us to proceed into uh, an informed um, compliance review of it. Because I know how well your mind works on these questions. I'm hearing you very respectfully, but I would like to point out two data points yeah. for your mind to chew on. If you go to page seven of 23 of the subdivision of Mm -hmm. and you go to 4.2.4 it doesn't yeah. say this is a completeness exercise the applicant shall submit evidence to the board to show compliance with compliance with section five of this ordinance section six of the lose up then here's your second data point. go to section five general requirements tell me where it sends you back to section six a b and c of the land use ordinance i couldn't find it So my view is the drafters of the ordinance and the only drafters um, that, that count are the ones that finally say, as the legislative body, we're telling you this draft makes sense to, to us and we're adopting. And as I said before, the board is stuck with the standards of the ordinance. You may have a different view of what the, the, the town meeting meant. Mm -hmm. but you're stuck with the text of the ordinance and the text of 4.2.4 says what it says. And then the context for that is nothing signals you back to uh, section 6A, B, and C of the land use ordinance. Mm -hmm. Whereas in 4.2.4, it's pretty darn clear. We want you to deal with section six of the Luzo. And it isn't just for completeness, although it's a completeness review, I agree. It says in its plain text, shall submit evidence to the board to show compliance with section six. And it's not as though the public didn't debate this issue of, 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 um, uh, of compatibility, for instance, in 6A1. They had those issues clearly before you. You conducted the com completeness review as though it were a public hearing. And everybody that wanted a chance to speak to it had the chance to speak to it. So. All I'm suggesting to you is I can't find anything in the ordinance that accords with the view that all you're supposed to do is double up on the section six review. It, it points you to section six in one place in the subdivision ordinance, and that's in 4.2.4. But I'm a guy that likes to make sure I get all the data points lined up. So if you've got a different data point, please offer it. I mean, I so. So let's use just section 6A as an example. And um, as we were drilling down through the compliance checklist, you know, you were, we're going through section 6A and B, section six of the land use ordinance, which is comprised of section 6A, B, and C. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, 6A1, when we're getting into compatibility, and we were talking about, you know, incompatibility talks about the proposed use should be compatible with permitted uses in the district, which it's located and measured in terms of physical size, visual impact, proximity, other structures, and density of development. I don't feel like the board really dug into that at the completeness review point. 
Well, it was my I understanding mean, that, that we went through the completeness of your review to say that they provided yeah. information on the subject, but we never yeah. said yes, and you effectively, um, uh, you know, that you succeeded in that section. I thought we was just like <laughs> the completeness we just discussed, yeah. like it's all right, there. Right, but you're using you're using a practice that probably has been your past practice. Mm -hmm. It helps to inform, but it, it's not definitive. What's definitive? As to what you do is the plain text of the ordinance. And again, but your I, argument. I recommend to you. I recommend to you. There's no argument here. I'm just trying to guide the board in accordance with 4.2.4 and then section five. And I don't find the specific direction to go back to section six in section five. If you find that for me, please call it out. I don't see it there. But when we were reviewing the again, Andy, and now. You know, I'm not no, trying to repeat myself. No, I'm not you, you trying can, to be you can do whatever you want. You're, I'm not trying to board. be not trying to be argumentative, but so in the context of compatibility, oh, let's say density of development, for instance, the board was looking at that again in the context of completeness. Well, do they have in their application, you know, submittals relative to the density of the development? They absolutely do. They have calculations, they have explanations of how it was, you know, the, the context of the calculations. And then the board had a had a finding on that and found that to be had a favorable finding to find that complete. But we didn't dig into the calculation of density of development or any further, you know, my, my notes suggest that you did. You had yeah. several colloquies with both the applicant and members of the public yeah. as to density of development. Well, we can, I, I would say, we may be able to park this particular conversation yeah. because if we listen to the applicant's counsel and we listen to the interested parties' counsel, they've kind of set up this interesting duality between do we have a workforce subdivision that's got these open space requirements or do we have something other than a workforce subdivision? Right. More, more in the nature of a conventional subdivision. and. So that whole compatibility discussion, if you're going to do it over again, I would do it over in the context of answering the question that is in 4.7. Excuse me, I jumped ahead. Take ahead of just second. Oh, 5.7.3. I'm sorry. Because really, what this is about is open space and density. I mean, that's really what this is boiling down to. As I listened to the last meeting, as I'm listening to the presentation of the council at oh, this meeting, 5.7.3 says you have to determine if a division of land will be reviewed as a cluster, a workforce, or a conventional subdivision. So you are directed by your ordinance to do five again. You had to do it as part of completeness review. You have to do it again as part of your final uh, board decision on the application because it directs you to do section five again. It doesn't direct you to do section six again. And it may be irrelevant in light of what the applicant's counsel has said to you. So it, can I allow us to park this one and just move on with three other points and we can come back to this one. It, depending upon what you determine, you did when you did completeness review. And again, I'm just pointing you to the plain text of 4.2.4. It says they have to submit evidence which shows compliance with the standards, not just did, did you check the box, it was compliance with it, okay? If, if you're not comfortable with that, let's let's move on and see how the other steps that, that I placed before you work for you. At this meeting, having determined by 4-0 votes of the board that the subdivision application is complete, the board is now under sections five point, excuse me, four point five, public hearing. Under four point six, final plan having been submitted, and then four point seven, notification of final flat plan submittal, completeness on that, and to determine that, I think you'd look now to completeness in the context of the requirements of four point six point two. So just so that you're with me, members of the board. If we could go to 4.6.2. Mm -hmm. 
4.6.2 says the final flat plan must consist of one original transparency miler and eight copies of one or more maps or drawings similar to those prepared for preliminary plat submission. What has to be on the plat? It has to have the name, registration number, and seal of the registered land surveyor who prepared the final plat shown on the plat. Roads and rights of way, open spaces, designation of all easements, areas reserved for dedicated to public use, and areas reserved by the subdivider. Four lots. Again, we've got a single lot developmental subdivision here. Uh, permanent reference monuments, performance bond uh, to secure completion of any public improvements uh, that may be required by the board. Land dedication, if any, and the approval space. That's the standards for completeness of the con in the context of final plan review. What do you have to determine as part of your final decision? Go to 4.8.1. The board must, within 30 days of the completion of a public hearing, or within 60 days of having received a completed application, whichever is later, or within such other time limit as may be mutually agreed to, that's what we did back in June, we mutually agreed to a different time, issue an order denying or granting approval of the proposed subdivision or granting approval on such terms and conditions as it may deem advisable to satisfy what standards? The criteria contained in this ordinance, this ordinance, it doesn't say the land use ordinance in that context. And in Title 30A MRS Section 4404, which has got a market basket of 14 standards, some of which are not even applicable to this project. Um, and to preserve the public's health, safety, and, and general welfare. Well, as legal counsel for the board, I'm instructing you not to make up standards. If you can convince yourselves and me that there's something that's not covered by the standards, that's fine. Why are we be continually being told that? You know, I, I, I don't General know. welfare? No, I just, you know, we've got a really tenured board here, you know, and we understand. Okay. Can you guys speak a little louder? That, 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 yeah. yeah. That's fine. Yeah. It, it says, in all instances, the burden of proof is on the subdivider. Um, if you do issue a negative decision, you have to make specific findings of fact that a project does not meet the provisions of the ordinance. Um, and section 4404 goes on to say the town's comprehensive plan. I don't think that is an enforceable requirement uh, or land use ordinance. So in the case of a denial, you got to do findings for, for those specific sections. That's all I can find, Chairman Hamlet, that would suggest that you're not um, to do a section six, six review of the land use ordinance again. If you do a section six review, it's basically a do over of a step you've undertaken. And it's the only time that you undertake that review is the time of completeness review, based upon what I find, unless you're on your way to issuing a denial. If you do, then you're going to have to use all of these sections that the drafters and adopters of this ordinance set forth. For you. Mm -hmm. So, that may be more than you wanted, but it's necessary because actually by talking about the full menu of requirements, it shows you, I think, how simple this is. It's basically a question on a 4.6.2. Have you got elements of the final flat plan that you need? But you first have to decide, can we give this applicant notice that they've met the 4.6.2 requirements? Then you proceed to have the public hearing uh, go forward, and then you determine whether uh, you approve, approve with conditions or deny, based upon a review of the standards set forth in the ordinance, and only the standards set forth in the ordinance. There are some arguments that are made that I'd like to touch on later, but we can take those mm -hmm. in Please. I, I don't understand where in your the conversation of this, it, it the ordinance, the other things were completeness, not a, approval of the section. So in the way that you're setting it up, I don't hear when it is that the applicant would be submitting information that as as we have, they have one understanding and that maybe we don't feel that they understood, they provided all the information and their argument for it, but where do you have the opportunity to review that and say, no, you actually haven't met the ordinance because all we if we're if we do a completeness and we kept on being told it was a completeness review, I I thought 
Yeah. That that and then the way that I read it is the board decision. That that's when we just say yes, they provided us with all their information. There are no holes in the information. Here's their argument that that they should be able to do it this way. And this is that this meeting is when we say yes, we agree with all of their arguments, or no, we don't agree with their arguments. We don't so, agree that. So thank you for the question because I think what I'm now thinking about it registers for me, having sat with this board in the context of site plan reviews under the land use ordinance, that's what you do for completeness review. You have to look with me, if you would, for the plain text of 4.2.4 per second. I know, it's, I, know it's, I know it's challenging, but you're, you're guided by the plain text of your ordinance. Sure. So just one second. Yeah, let's, one second. let's let Andy finish his comment here and then. So 4.2.4, .4, says subdivision ordinance review is different than land use ordinance review. It says applicant submits evidence to the board to show compliance with it. What do you think those terms show compliance with? Evidence. Um, they show evidence. They don't they don't show that doesn't doesn't indicate that it's true. It's it's just evidence. Yeah. That they I, where's the decision? I would agree with Meredith's statement that we did not get into compliance review deep discussion on section six during the completeness review. And what the planning board commonly does as we are a human board and we try to let, and we are here representing the res residents of the town, you know, we are, I think, always inclusive of measured public comment on on specific topics and as we were drilling down through completeness and as the board has demonstrated in the past and other similar reviewed projects we allowed public comment and of course when you do that the discussion expands but that was by no means the the under and i'm speaking for the board here um in understanding that at that point we were making a compliance decision on section six. So I, I would suggest to you either the ordinance, the subdivision ordinance needs to be amended to accord with your practice or your practice needs to accord with 4.2.4. And I say that very respectfully and very carefully yeah. in a very measured fashion because subdivision ordinance review is not the same thing as land use ordinance review. Yes. And I think there's a bit of confusion because the board does have a practice with completeness review to just say, is there anything there that we can find in the application that checks the box? This language is different than what you'll find in the land use ordinance for completeness review. I've looked and I see a difference. And so I would just remind everybody in this proceeding that particularly in the context of a fully controverted proceeding, you need to follow the rules set forth in the plain text of the ordinance. And I'm not actually overly concerned about the section six review, except the length of time it's gonna take with everybody that could have comments under 6A, 6B, and 6C. It may be moot. And what I think the board may wanna do is pivot back to the conversation between the council for the applicant and the council for the interested parties, because I think what's happened here is the applicant had a realization since the last meeting and said, we, we're working with a confusing set of standards related to workforce subdivisions. And if I read Mr. Pelagi's paragraph three, number three on page three, it's right there in the plain text of his letter. And he's giving you a view from the applicant. He can't submit a letter like this unless he's talked to the applicant. You can ask the applicant, do they agree with his view of the application? If they say no, we should we, we should understand that quickly. If they say yes, they're entitled as the applicant to put before you how under 5.7.3. And I was just reading it tonight, and I was struck by the fact that you have to determine this. There's no choice. You have to determine if a division of land will be reviewed as a cluster, a workforce, or a conventional subdivision. Again, this is not a typical division of land. This is a developmental subdivision. But I think in light of paragraph number three on page three of Mr. Kalegi's letter, 
you might want to ask them, did you mean what you said? And make sure the applicant's team is all comfortable with that, because if they are, that's that's a bit different than going into the details of what Mr. Burns has argued, because he said, I was prepared to argue what, what had happened at the completeness review. So uh, it may moot all of my points, and I'm, I don't want to ever take issue with a board that I'm advising, but I do want a board that I'm advising to follow the standards that the legislative body has given you. And I'm a little bit concerned that not the board so much, but the public and the board could get off track with this particular review. I saw it start to happen with a completeness review. I'm really concerned. Hey, Bill, Bill, can I, can I make a yeah, comment? Dave and then Dave and then Mr. Burns. Dave. Yeah, I, I, I think it might simplify matters if we do find out if the applicant is willing to submit as a developmental subdivision instead of a workforce subdivision. And then, I mean, that if that's the direction that they would like to go in, I think it makes a lot of sense. And I think it might clear up a lot of the confusion that we have here. Okay. Well, let's, yeah. I, Mr. Burns was before you, but let's come back. Let's let him speak, and then I'll, we'll come right to you, Greg. I, I want to be very brief here. Uh, I, 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 I'm confused. I think I'm just confused. I'm to say you might be. Um, I, the, the board is required to undertake a substantive review of all the Section 6 provisions of the ordinance. Section 5 says that. Section 6 in its preface says uh, you affirmatively have to uh, undertake those reviews. To the extent the board believes that they have not done that yet, I would occur to you. Plus, what you know already occurred. It, the, the notion that your completeness determination doubled as a substantive review of those provisions undermines the very idea of what a completeness review is supposed to be. Uh, there are very significant legal uh, components that come into play in terms of timing and, and applicable uh, timing of review. If, if your completeness review is treated as a substantive review, um, it also raises due process concerns insofar as you undertook the substantive determination before you undertook the public hearing. I, I would encourage you to uh, follow, uh, to undertake a full substantive review of this, uh, this uh, subdivision. Uh, as to all applicable standards, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm frankly confused as to uh, why it would be otherwise, uh, given that uh, the plain language of Section 6 requires you to make an affirmative determination for any approval that you're rendering for those provisions of that. The board undertook a completeness review, a public hearing happened, and also closed. Uh, Attorney Hamilton noted that this uh, Lawton and Usha public comment. Uh, our view is that you're no longer, you close the public here. You're no longer required to undertake additional public comment. Uh, I believe you closed the record when it comes to your fact finding. Uh, so, my understanding, I, I believe this is your understanding as well, is that tonight was uh, an opportunity for you, the board, to undertake your, your full substantive review of all applicable provisions. Um, and I would encourage you to do that. And, um, I would object on the record to the extent that you determined that. Uh, You've already undertaken substantive review of the section six standards uh, referenced by him. Greg. Well, I just um, first wanted to clarify for the record that we have applied under workforce housing the letter of uh, submittal to final subdivision, which you had submitted on day we agreed, said we are carrying forward all the previous applications. If you read the very first line in there, which you found complete and voted on. We applied as a workforce housing subdivision. So there's there's no question of that. I'll let um, Mr. Pelegi address his letter in a way, um, should he choose. The second part I do want to point out to the board, if you would take a moment and turn to section 4521 in the subdivision order. Page eight, if you give a moment to read that section. What section? Four, five, two, one. So here's, here's the guidance. We 
have to find compliance of a LUZO and prior in section four during completeness. Evidence of compliance was voted on. The next guidance, which is given before we go to the final subdivision, which is the roadmap, it says the board shall indicate the applicant in writing of these deficiencies. Submission of the final file without correcting these deficiencies are grounds for dismissal. There were no deficiencies written in after the voting of compliance. We have submitted the required documentation for completeness on 462. There, that, there are the cadence. There's an order. We went through it. 4521 tells you what the next step is. We did not receive a letter stating any deficiencies. We then went on to submission requirements for the final plan. That's pretty clear. All I wanted to point out. So if, if I could um, clarify my observations in response to Attorney Burns' good suggestion that what I was saying is you only conduct a substantive review once at the time of completion. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that the subdivision ordinance and the municipal subdivision law direct how you do a subdivision review. This is not a typical garden variety land use ordinance review. It's not a site plan review. So what I'm trying to have the board do is kind of get that notion out of their head. You're not doing land use ordinance review. You're doing a subdivision review. Why does that matter? Because the main legislature directed that the only folks that can do a review of a subdivision is the municipal review authority. Guess who that is? That's the planning board. So you have to apply the statutory requirements and your subdivision ordinance requirements. And I don't disagree with Mr. Johnston. I don't find the need to use 4.5.2.1 to get to the conclusion I've drawn after a careful review of the structure of subdivision ordinance for Mount Reserve, right alongside most other Hancock County Regional Planning Commission subdivision ordinances that are drafted for communities. Because as a factual matter, most of these subdivision ordinances aren't drafted by a committee. It's not like the ordinance review committee that sometimes acts in Mount Desert in proposing amendments to the land use ordinance. This subdivision ordinance was basically handed to you by a regional planning commission. And then you had a chance to tweak it if you wanted. Then the voters voted it. So uh, respectfully, I know you have a past practice with land use ordinance reviews, but subdivision ordinance review is a different species of review and it has its own rules and its own structure and its own fabric. And I'm just trying to make sure that you listen to me when I say the fabric is different with a subdivision ordinance review because it's got the state statute. It's called the Maine Municipal Subdivision Act. And it's got a set of ordinances. Some communities, because they're authorized by state statute to adopt regulations, actually adopt regulations. It's usually regulations of the planning board. In this case, you don't have to worry about that. You've got an ordinance adopted by town meeting and you're stuck with the standards and the approach taken in that ordinance. And that ordinance says, you test compliance with sections six, 6A, 6B, 6C of the land use ordinance at the time of completeness review. You conducted your public hearing, Attorney Burns is quite correct. You close the public hearing. You then got into a discussion of exactly how are you going to do your final decision making. And you said, we're going to do that on August 9th, which was beyond the 60 days. So you needed the agreement of the applicant and all the interested persons here. I would ask if the applicant team could take 10 minutes to caucus, because I do see something different in Mr. Pelegi's letter than the earlier application review, and it really matters. Because how you conduct the density review under the Section 5 general requirements is pretty different depending upon what you do. My read of Attorney Pelegi's letter is he may have figured something out that was challenging us during the last review at the time of completeness, and that is how do the density and open space requirements under workforce housing talk to them? And I would adjure the applicant's team to take 10 minutes, talk with Attorney Pelegi, Mr. Musson, Mr. Johnston. Kathy should lead the team and just go have a conversation and just make sure that what I picked up in his letter 
is something that could be helpful to the board to really short this meeting tonight. Otherwise, it's going to get into a lot of the detail questions that attorney Burns fairly raises, but the applicant is entitled between completeness review after sketch plan review and final plan to say, this is how we want to proceed. So if we could take 10 minutes, that would be good because it'll make a difference. It'll also give more air a chance to come back into this room. <laughs> <laughs> if you know right. I'm, I'm So not let's sure. take a 10 minute recess. All right, let's get back to it. So meeting is back in order 7 57 p.m and uh one point of clarification the board historically has a hard line in the sand at nine o'clock so wherever we may be we will be there at nine all right we just had a 10 minute recess so the applicant could have a discussion and is there any findings from the discussion, Greg? Sure. This is like this slide. You're on, Dan. Thank you. Um I didn't in writing my letter to the board, it wasn't my intent to create confusion. It was my intent to demonstrate to the board that the another way of calculating the um, the way in which we're using the lot. To, to address density bonuses and open space requirements. And I tried to give you guys an example showing that the conventional subdivision, we had the number, the correct number of our dwelling units that were allowed per lot and um, no reduction in open space. This is workforce housing. We applied for it to be workforce housing. We are um, have represented to the community and to the board that um, we are applying uh, covenants to each of these uh, condominium units, uh, uh, deeds to the condominium units that um, have workforce components. It is important, it's critical to our mission to provide workforce housing. And, and, and I think that, um, that it is important that we fulfill that mission. Now, I wanna to talk to you about density I think you get to the same place whether you use the decimals and fractions that Mr. Burns talks about or whether you use the minimum, the minimum lot size per lot in uh, BR1 is 10,000. You can reduce it to 5,000 square feet if you, uh, if you under workforce or cluster house. When you do the calculation of, of what we're doing with one lot, that obviously is more than 10,000 square feet. For the purpose of calculating density for subdivisions that include workforce housing, the area of the entire parcel may be used, including wetland and steep slopes. That includes all of the area. It doesn't say exclude fractional units. It doesn't, doesn't say exclude portions of acres. It says um, use the entire area of the lot. And when you do, you get to the same calculation that's in our application, you get six units. If you look at it my way, when we talk about the workforce housing and being designed to allow greater density on a site and that open space requirements are tied to the manner in which the lot size is diminished, the, the overall lot area is diminished. I tried to give you an example to show you that we are not, if we did it conventionally, with six units that do not be reducing the, um, the lot size. Turn the volume up. Oh, sorry, but I'm used to talking to you here and I'm used yeah. to talking to you and it's hard. I apologize. Thanks. Usually, I mean, court people yell at me to stop yelling at them. So mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll do better. Okay, so I, I just wanna make it clear. I appreciate Mr. Hamilton's um, invitation. Um, I, I just um, 
for, for a variety of reasons, including our mission. This is workforce housing. It's what we applied for. It's what you found complete. Um, and if you use the uh, the calculations that are required under 562.2, which is using the entire lot, one lot, um, and calculate uh, calculate density, we are not going below the, uh, the we're not asking for a reduction in lot size. That being said, there's no mandatory open space requirement. Provide some open space. There's no mandatory open space requirement. Hope that. I talked a lot to try and clear things up, and I'm not sure I did, but that, that's my intent. But we're not changing the, the application to be something that's not. So, Mr. Chairman, if I might gently suggest that if your bewitching hour is nine o'clock, and I, I fully endorse that, <laughs> uh, then you're not going to be covering much more tonight because um, what I want to make sure is that when the board gets ready to conduct a review of this application, you have the standards of 4404, every one of them that's applicable in front of you. I want to make sure that you have all the Section 5 standards. What I'd like to ask Mr. Pelegi to come back up and answer as counsel for the applicant, for whom due process is principally intended, it's there for interested persons as well, but the applicants got to get due process here tonight. I just want to set up what I think is the framework for this review and just ask three questions. And I can do them in quick, seriatim fashion. Number one, do you think we have to make findings under sections five of the subdivision ordinance? And does that, in your view, pull in sections six A, six B, and six C of the land use ordinance? As an attorney who's been before this board on a very long-winded project, <laughs> you know 6A, 6B, and 6C. Uh, my question for you and your team is, the board's wrestling with this question of, we did a completeness review uh, under 4.2.4. We really didn't do a substantive review. That may be academic if, as part of establishing a sufficient record for review by the Superior Court, and I just would remind everybody in the room, typically land use reviews by this board go to the Board of Appeals. Uh-uh, not with subdivisions. They go direct to the Superior Court. So given what the courts of Maine have said about the sufficiency of findings so that the court can determine what was reviewed and what findings were made as part of that review, what are your thoughts in terms of whether the board has to go back to Section 6A, 6B, and 6C again? As part of substantive review, do you have a problem? I do. I do. I'm going to rely on Greg to give you section numbers to so bring my that part of the ordinance up with me. I believe you that you're not required to go back and do that analysis under six A B and C. The second question I have for you is: Do you believe that whether the board approves, approves with conditions, or denies the project, the board must make findings sufficient to give the court a record to review on appeal? I do. Okay. You, you still got a section six under the land use ordinance question in your minds. I don't have it, but you do. And <laughs> it's you that matters because you're the reviewing authority. So we'll we'll continue to wrestle with that question. I guarantee you we're not even going to get to 6A, 6B, and 6C, even if you determine that you have to do it again. But for now, at least understand what two attorneys are saying. Um, attorney Burns, do you have a different... <laughs> We do have a different view, don't you, on whether 6A, B, and C need to be reviewed again? I do. As I said, uh, our, our our view is that uh, your substantive review requires you to undertake a fulsome review of all applicable ordinances, including uh, Section 6. Uh, to the extent that you determined that the application was complete, i.e. that the applicant provided uh, sufficient evidence for you to undertake that substantive review, uh, that is certainly the, the role of a completeness determination. Um, but any decision that this board makes, any final decision that this board makes, needs to reflect a substantive determination that all ordinance provisions that are applicable are met, uh, which would include 6A, 6B. So you have a split on that question. The, 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 the final question I have for Mr. Blady is this. Um, could a member of your team, when the board calls upon the, the need for this, do a very simple, clear review of both the open space and density requirements for a workforce housing 
subdivision because it's 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 got to be clear on the record uh, for the board, and it's got to be clear on the record for any court reviewing uh, the decision. Yes, do you want us to do that tonight, or do you want us to do that when you? That's the so, pleasure of the board. So, just trying to condense all of this sure. in, into please, please in, into a direction. Can we? Can we try to move on from just reviewing how we're gonna review this yeah. and get a and get a consensus of okay, what's what is the first compliance checklist we're drilling down through? And from my understanding from the subdivision ordinance, it's section five of the ordinance. Yes, but before you get to section five, you've got four point six point two. They submit a final plot plan. You have to determine under 4.7, as we discussed before the mm -hmm. meeting. I asked, do you plan to try to get to board decision, uh, which is 4.8? And so, to, to get to 4.8, you got to go through 4.6. Yeah, so procedurally, can we take care of that? Sure, sure. That's easy to do. Yeah. Let's start easier. <laughs> let's start picking the fruit off the tree here. Yeah. Okay. So if you turn to 4.6.2 on page 8 of 23. Eight of 23, 4.6.2. I'm going to read it, Andy. I love that. That sounds great. All right. So 462, the final plot plan. So consist of one original transparency, eight copies or, uh, of one or more maps of drawings similar to those prepared for preliminary plat submission. In addition to all those items required on the preliminary plat, unless otherwise indicated by the board, the following items shall be required as, final, as part of the final plot plan submission. Uh, who the surveyor is, the name, registration number, and seal, the roads and right of ways, open spaces, lots, location bearing, and length of every line, permanent reference monuments, the location of permanent markers set at the corners, six, performance bond, a performance bond to secure completion of all public improvements required by the board. Uh, seven, land dedication, written copies of any documents of land dedication, written evidence of the municipal officers are satisfied with legal sufficiency of the, any documents. Eight, approval space, suitable <laughs> space to record on the approved plot plan the date and conditions of the approval. And the ordinance gives an example of that. <laughs> Yeah. Greg, would you like to submit the final plot plan to the board? Sure, Emily. I think with our submittal, you should have that plot plan and those we do. items are on there. We have the monumentation. Uh, we can seal upon who we do have a copy of this seal plan to get there. Uh, that is on that uh, We have it with us. Note. Roads and right of ways are noted. Any areas preserved that require wooded buffer required for stormwater over the ordinances is dedicated. From the reference monuments, you'll see pins can be set. <clears throat> the monuments at the corner, granite monument style throughout it. Form bond. Um, the board at their discretion uh, can require performance bond. When you look at the, the reasons you can, you can decide whether or not to require performance bond uh, to defray the costs of anything to the town. Uh, that's something the board should take up and discuss uh, and approval space. And I think we'll see that yeah. on the plan, I would find a subdivision plan for the EO subdivision. So when, when are we gonna get the registered stamp plan? Have the registered stamp plan with me. Yep. And should you make a vote, you would be signing a registered stamp plan. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so the the final stamp plan is pending. The roads and right of ways are indicated on the plan. The open spaces, the dedication of easements, public use areas, you know, they're indicated on the plan here. Um, two of the board wants to chime in on any of this checklist. Lots, the lots are described on here with the length and bearing of the you lines. Mean, you mean singular lot? Lot, right? Yes. There are no lots within right. the lot boundary, right? The lots. I was just reading item four. Yeah, yeah. It I, says I, I just want you to be clear with the public that there's a single lot um, subdivision. It's a developmental subdivision. So mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, permanent reference monuments. They're indicated on and noted on the final plot. Um, well, so let's um, let's talk about the performance bond. Andy, any thoughts on? Yeah, if I listened, if I listened correctly to the, your last review for the applicant, they're not proposing any public improvements. That's not quite what this says. This requires. This says um, a performance bond can be required. It's 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 mandatory only if the board requires public improvements. And I'm scratching my head and wanting input from the applicant. As to whether I recalled correctly, the, the board probably recalls. I think they said there were no public improvements, but maybe there are none. So we moved on through the performance bond is to defray the cost that the town may have in preparing something um, that is left undone. Left undone. Um, in this case, we're not extending the public way. Uh, we are carrying services into the site. Um, there's little risk that the developer would um, uh, 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 damage the public in a way that the town could not repair. So at your discretion, and I think it's actually defines uh, performance bond, uh, what it can be used for. Exactly, thank you. Uh, page 14 of yeah. the this, to defray all expenses of proposed improvements. So, yeah, but say there's, there's a narrow case. question, Mr. Johnson. I just want to uh, repose what the chair asked you. you. Just keep your answer brief if you can. Uh, performance bond to secure completion of all public improvements required by the board. Do you think there are public improvements that the board could require? I'm waiting for the chair to ask me the question. Well, <laughs> he asked my I, question. I, didn't hear, I, I heard that, but I was, I was listening for the chair's question. Do you think there's any any part of this project that would require the the necessity of a performance bond? I don't think so. Why? We're not extending the public infrastructure into the site. You're, and talk about what the public uh, infrastructure connection so the sewer involves. The sewer, we will connect to the sewer, but the sewer will have to be maintained privately. The water is a private district, not a public district. That will be interior to the site and maintained, and the road will remain private. We do have to have road opening cuts. There's a fee to cut the pavement in the road for road opening permits. Not a road, so let's. So let's um, let's have a little bit of a discussion here on the board and find a hopefully a position on the requirement of a performance bond. Where's Dave? Upper right. Dave, any thoughts on a performance bond? I don't. I don't think a performance bond is necessary. Pretty simple. It's happening on private property. Yeah. So I don't I don't see where the town is at risk of anything. Yeah, I mean they're 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 connecting to established infrastructure. They're not creating connecting 
expanding anything out beyond the, the lot in question. So <laughs> the very worst, like I suppose the worst case scenario that would impact the town, I would suppose, is, is if they opened up the road to make the connection for all the development was left and, and they abandoned it at the point that they opened the road mm -hmm. and they couldn't close the road. But that, that little bit of opening is the only thing that's mm -hmm. the town is exposed to. So let's, what about the water? So, yeah, yeah I, I want to understand what, what private water district is. I didn't, I didn't understand that. Uh, the, the water in town is owned by private district. Yeah, um, it's a private. No, district. no, the district. Non deserved water district is a quasi municipal public district. It is not a private district. Uh, I go to the mat on that. Yeah, all right. For the reason that I, I I established it to acquire the assets of Seal Harbor and Northeast Harbor Water Company, so I know oh. it's a it's a specially chartered public water district. So if that's the district we're talking about, is the district at risk if you don't make certain improvements for the water line? And do you have otherwise have an arrangement with the district? Uh, the district has provided a letter. Of adequate capacity and reviewing our standards. Yep. Um, whether they feel it's of a risk, I would have to ask them. And I think it's well, part of the board to decide um, that question. They they provided a letter though saying, what does the letter say? Take a look. Um, it's six, yes. Nine yeah. There it is. The sentence that says we have no further reservations regarding the claims submitted to us. Um, They'll expect a, a sealed stamp set of engineering plans submitted to our office for further coordination prior to construction. Don't see anything there that invokes any kind of uh, performance bond requirement. So, back to a potential motion. Dave doesn't think we need a performance bond. Meredith doesn't. We're voting on something? Well, just discussing. Oh. I concur. Yeah, I concur too. So how about we get a motion on the table relative to the requirement of a performance bond? Um, that's within the section which we haven't voted. Your well, we're, it doesn't make sense to be pulling one section out of the section well, to vote on. I well, I think that. Andy, correct me if I'm mistaken, but I think we need to make a determination if a performance bond is required in the context of the uh, potential um, vote on the uh, final block. So if I'm hearing um, the uh, two board colleagues correctly, there are two questions. One is, do you have to make a determination first so you can have an omnibus completeness motion to decide whether public improvements are required yes we need to decide that so that the proper motion can be formed and then i think meredith's question is does 4.6.2 contain the sole standard for purposes of completeness of a final platform application complaint i can't find others but if board members can then maybe there's something outside of 4.6.2 <laughs> But I'm looking at 4.7 Meredith, and it says after the board has received the final plot plan and all the information required to be submitted with it, as Mr. Johnston said earlier tonight, if you felt there was more information you needed for the final plot plan, you uh, would have noted that in your completeness determination. You would have said it's complete, but for these things, and it's deficient in these respects. The board, as far as I know, Kim, did not give notice of any deficiencies as to the completeness. No. Okay, so I think you're now down to 4.6.2 as the complete universe of things you have to 
check the box on it, if that's helpful. Here. I was more wondering whether it was that we voted just on that section or we voted on the, the whole section yeah. with the little I think side we, note of we are not requiring a performance. And my understanding was we vote on a performance bond Good, and then ahead. and then we have a vote on the whole section. Let's do that. Go ahead. All right. So we need I make a motion that we uh all agree that we're not requiring a performance bond. I'll second that. All right. All those in favor, Dave. Dave Ashmore, aye. Meredith. Randolph, aye. Tracy. Tracy Keller, aye. Myself, William Hanley, aye. All right. Um, land dedication, written copies, uh, any documents of land dedication, written evidence of the municipal offers are satisfied with the legal sufficiency of any documents conveying such land de dedication. What is that, Andy? Typically, when you have a dedication of land, um, you have the municipal officers, not the municipal review authority. You have the municipal officers. In this case, the select board of the town of Mount Desert look at it and say, uh, and then probably have the town attorney opine upon whether those documents conveying the land that dedication are satisfactory. Um, I don't know that there was a communication to the select board. I may have missed it. Um, so I don't think the select board has passed on on this if they need to. Is there a land land dedication? Is there a land dedication? No. Well, so there you go. So it's an A. It's not applicable. Yeah. And, there, and there would be another sub vote that Meredith would ask about, and she could make a motion. <laughs> well, let's do it. Let's have a sub vote on that. A sub vote saying, okay, so, so there is no land dedication, so we that section does not apply. Um, Tracy Keller second. <laughs> all right, all those in favor, Meredith. Randolph, aye. Tracy. Tracy Keller, aye. Dave. Dave Ashmore, aye. And myself, William Manley, aye. Uh, last one, approval space. Suitable space to record on, on approved plot plan. It might be good to just ask Mr. Johnson for his exemplar plan. Yeah. So that you could see the seal. Yeah, let's um, see you're, it. You're not going to sign it tonight because you're no. not going to get through all the review standards, but it might be good to see what the plan I mean, is like. I mean, in the context of that last item, you know, there is space on the right. lot. Okay. Right. 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 I ran out of hands carrying stuff in my vehicle. That's fine. Uh, it can be. It's, it's going to have to be done anyway, and so I would handle that particular component as a conditional requirement. Yeah. At the time, there is a final plan application review vote. They must have presented you a plan that has the seal, so that you could make one item one registered land so there. Um, everything's there except the seals to be provided. Just just have a condition that suggests as to item one that they'll need to provide a sealed plan, flat plan. We have no objection to it. Again, we've taken many breaks and it's going to be less than the break uh, we've had. So, so if we're not going to proceed upon to the next section of compliance in this bit, it would be my choice to show you we have to sign five. Do you think you can produce it? I'm not sure. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> I mean, I'm <I'll> sorry. <laughs> five minute break. Let's take another five minute break. <laughs> Back at 8 30. Back at 8 30. All right, back to it from our five minute recess. And hopefully one of the day, one of these days, the chair could have a gavel. <laughs> a gavel. A gavel. We had a gavel. So there is. There you go. I actually thought your silver tone had substituted for the camera. The chair is now armed. <laughs> there. <laughs> Official. So um, I'm inclined to work with what we know at this point. Right. And what we know is that we have to drill down through section five right. and have compliance findings on section five. Yes, I think that makes sense. But if I may, yeah. briefly, 
I think it does make sense for council, for applicant and interested persons, because this question of 6A, 6B, and 6C is not going to get reviewed tonight anyway. There won't be time once we start into section five. We'd like you to give us your thoughts on whether the board has to conduct again a review of 6A, 6B, and 6C. I've stated my thoughts. I'll want um, Attorney Pelegi in, in a written form and, and Attorney Burns to address the board through the board chair with a letter. Um, copy me, if you would, please. And I'll be open to the possibility that I have a considered opinion, but I could be wrong. Uh, and so I want to hear from counsel about the applicant and the interested persons. Um, uh, does 6A, 6B, 6C need to be reviewed again? And if so, why? And if you give up your written submittal at least 10 days before the next meeting, one thing we'll also need to decide before nine o'clock is yeah. when you do the next review. But I, we need to stop a little before nine o'clock to figure out how we're handling the next meeting. Yeah, but, Mr. Chair, is that your, is that your preference for a written submittal? Say that. Is that your preference for a written submittal on that question? Yes, please. Okay. Um, if, if I may, uh, when would you like a written submission by? And 10 days before, so that we'll have at least 10 days to consider before the next meeting. And we're going to decide at some point when the next meeting, August 23rd, we'll make it. Yeah, yeah we're not we're not going to be able to do that. Unless, I, and, I won't be here August 23rd. Yeah. Some other. Like, oh, yeah. Why, why, why the acceleration compared to prior days? No, I'm just saying that the next meeting is August 23rd. Oh, you're saying the, yeah, the next that's regular schedule. 10 schedule. days before, that's the 13th. So let's look at the calendar. I can't do that. Either. No, I would not. <laughs> I didn't realize the board is meeting again on the 23rd. And, and I guess, is there going to be a quorum on the 23rd? Yeah, we meet the first Wednesday in September. You only need the, three, right? Me, second Wednesday in September. Can you, where's Dave? Uh, I don't see him there. Can you? I'm here. Uh, go back a page. Dave, are you here for the 23rd? Uh, I, I think so. I was just looking. The reason why I wasn't there, I was looking for my daytimer. You know, the, the one thing, too, where we're a partial board, I would really prefer that we have a complete board as possible. Mm -hmm. Well, so it's but, but, but truly for this particular project review, you've got what you've got. I wouldn't yeah. I wouldn't insert somebody into this review. No, no, but I would prefer that Meredith is here and Tracy is here and I'm here mm -hmm. and Dave is so here. How many people do you have on the 23rd? Three. three. We we're only at three. Okay. So uh, I could reduce the 10 days to five days, but the board has got to determine what you want to do about. Um, when's the next hearing after the 23rd? I, I don't have a calendar in front of me. Second Wednesday and day. It would be the 13th. 13th. 13th of December. Mm -hmm. Would you guys have any? Is it to be here? But I couldn't see Our daughter's getting married. Well, well that's so, a yeah, pretty good I'm going to be tomorrow. I'm going to be tomorrow. So, um, I, I would I would recommend to the board chair that you pivot between the 23rd and the 13th. So I would make the recommendation to the board to consider the 13th. So we're, so we're all here. So we're all here. Yeah. Dave, you're here on the 13th. But didn't Kathy just yes. say daughter's gonna be there? That's what she can no. do if you're but high she's gonna there. zoom in. Oh, okay. Yeah, they just need our they need your consent to. Keep extending this because as long as you're fine with the data. Mm -hmm. Yes, I want to keep it moving forward. Yes. Yeah, so, so and and then Andy, we would still maintain the 10 day submittal. Yeah, you could do it by the third. I look the council. The third is a Sunday. I I do it by frankly, you could do it one week in advance, the six, which is a Wednesday. So we at least have a week to to, to have the board speed the the writings and to um 
give me a, a little bit of time to look at them. So, so do point. we need to make a board finding on that? Yeah, what I would do is I'd set the schedule with a vote. You're, you're really already well, there. So the submittal would be due the 6th of September, and you'd meet again on the 13th on this project. Was that submittal by 11.59 p.m. 9.6? <laughs> I suppose. That really doesn't. Yeah. Okay, sure. End of work day. That's by yeah. 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 electronics yeah. Yeah. By, by, by four p.m. Yeah. And you can four do electronics. Four p.m. Yeah. Four p.m. Yeah. So let's let's get a motion for that and get that protocol out of the way. Geez, I thought I was in the business court there for a second. Okay. Make a motion to make the next meeting to a date certain of September 13th with uh, letters written on uh, section six relevance um, by September 6th at 4 p.m. Section six of the land is only correct. 10 days prior. We're Oh, didn't we say a week? Was say, say the six is fine by 4 p.m. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Gracie Keller, uh, second that. All right. All those in favor? Meredith? Randolph, aye. Tracy? Tracy Keller, aye. Dave? Dave Ashmore, aye. And myself, William Hanley, aye. Okay, going back to what we know. Greg, yeah, absolutely. Greg seems like he's got a section five. Greg's got something so to I, say. I just want to make sure that you were, we passed 4 7 um, and we're headed to a date certain. I want to make sure the board is submitted um, to us in writing the final subdivision. I talked to Kim and um, Chairman Hanley at the break. Kim's going to help me craft a letter for Chairman Hanley to review and, and submit to the applicant. So that, 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 that will be. That would be the big danger. You guys have just got we'll get we'll get that. We'll get that done. Okay. As the yeah. ordinance require. Do we need to have a finding on that, Andy? Nope. We've already made the finding under 4.6. And that takes care of what you need to do for 4.7. All we have to do is make sure you issue it in writing. We've yeah. already you've already taken action up above. Oh. May I ask? Um, nope. Uh, never mind. I was looking at eight, which has got conditions and waivers, but that's in the context of the final thing. Mm -hmm. Is that one you were doing? So it is. That's taken care of. See, and this is what happens when you start approaching nine o'clock. Did we get a, a vote on? Um, Compliance with the final plot plan submittal. In we took the sub approval vote. I thought they took the main approval vote. No, we we didn't. So we, we didn't. Okay. So, so we we need the please. we need the overall compliance yeah. vote on section four six two. Uh, could could I make a suggestion because I've got a conditional suggestion for item one under four point six point two? Sure, Andy. <laughs> And, and it would be to just um, support Meredith's um, motion that you understand that the sealed plat plan. This is it. Does this have the seal of the surveyor? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. But you've got it. You don't have to make a condition. Never mind. Sorry. That's why I went out to his car. Yes. Yeah. Very yes. good. Okay. So we have a motion, or I will make a motion that. We uh, just oh. for, for for clock running purposes, uh, I guess generally the decision by the board becomes a capital P decision with 30 day appeal deadline. I I just uh, my experience usually is straw straw votes are taken until a final decision is made. I would just caution the board from making a substantive determination on a component of this ordinance before you're ready to make a final written decision, just for clarity of when a decision is being made. Uh, I'm comfortable with what the board's been doing. I don't see the need for a straw vote. You know, that may be something Attorney Burns is familiar What's with. What's a straw vote? Straw vote right. means it doesn't count at all. And you've got to, you've actually got to make a determination because 4.7 yeah. says after the board has received the final plot plan and all the information required be submitted with it, the board shall notify the subdivider in writing that a completed subdivision application for 
has been filed. So who I, makes the completed application to terminate? And you do. That's not a strong vote. That's that's a vote. So I would agree with that procedure. That was a lot of lawyer talk. Yeah. Okay, so I made the motion that <laughs> um, uh, that all of the uh, requirements of four point six point two. Um, have been adequately represented on the plot. Well, I, I, I'd frame it as the, the board's determined that you now have a completed final subdivision flat planning application. You're the lawyer. Okay, yes, that's what I meant. Yeah, that's so totally what I meant. <laughs> Dave Ashmore, that's second. Okay. Yes, that was my motion. So Did, Ashmore is second. Dave got the second. Yeah. So all those in favor, Meredith. Randolph, aye. Dave. Dave Ashmore, aye. Tracy. Tracy Keller, aye. And myself, we manly, aye. And we don't need a binding on 4-7. So so we have so to issue the letter so to be that, signed by the chairman. Does everybody in the room agree that a letter from the chairman to the applicant will satisfy the requirement of 4.7? Hearing not, yes, you're good. All right. So that pushes us into the review of section five yeah. general requirements and there's lots of things in section five <laughs> so 20 till should how do you feel about um just getting the ball rolling and starting to talk about section five one buffer script. Mm -hmm. uh, so bear with me while while I read a bit of section five one buffer strip. This is under general requirements, section five of the subdivision ordinance. And what buffer strip talks about is that buffering elements are screening in the form of architectural or landscape design are required to preserve the character and stability of allowed uses in adjoining areas to enhance the visual and aesthetic image of the district and to minimize negative impacts between uses. Buffers may be used for passive recreation. They may con they contain pedestrian trails provided that each use does not compromise its primary function and that the screening may consist of a natural area of trees or shrubs and plant or a planted evergreen belt or any combination of the two which meets the following performance standard. The natural area of planted belt may contain sufficient number and species selected and planted according to generally accepted horticultural practices to yield an an effective screen in four years. A fence, berm, wall, or other such construction may be included in such screens. And buffers shall be considered in or for the following areas of purposes, among others, along property lines to yield various, various uses of each other. Two, along interior roads running parallel to roads exterior to the site to prevent confusion, particularly at night. Three, outside storage. All outside storage areas, loading docks, storage tanks, garbage collection areas, electrical transformers, service areas, and similar functions shall be screened from public view. Walls, fencing, screening, dense plant materials, or a combination of material can be used to achieve this intent. And four, to block prevailing wind patterns and stop windborne debris from leaving the site. So there's one more sentence. And Sorry. one one more sentence. Thank you. Driveway accesses shall be designed so as to minimize the visual interruption of the buffer areas. And perhaps the applicant could first just talk about the buffer strip. So you'll first find if you want to tire and turn tap 12. Ron tab 12. You've got a landscaping buffering plan. And uh, if we count them up, there's there's greater than 35 trees being planted, um, including the existing ones, exceeds 60 trees. 
Um, if you count the number of dogwoods out there, which are fairly substantial for growth, it's another 20 feet of them. Um, this is a substantial amount of screening you can see on that plan. Regarding the entrances, you'll notice that the ferns and lower shrubs are lowered at the entrance to not obscure um, sites that come up and down the road. Um, that does not even go to say the smaller uh, shrubs and rhododendrons, but uh, effective to the screen. So you guys have a landscape and buffering plan. Um, we've also preserved a hedgerow along the right of way to the south. Um, and in addition, you see the fence that was there being reconstructed. The same tab has a fence of the buffer. Um, so you may keep those to work. The buffers are along property lines, secure roads, and outdoor storage and blocking prevailing winds. Mm -hmm. How is the buffer? Are, are you buffering storage areas and tanks and garbage collection areas? How, how is that working? So the entire perimeter of the property is, is, is buffered to the inside. To the inside. But there are does are there buffering requirements, Andy, within a site between buildings? So the challenge with this subdivision ordinance, um, given the nature of the project, which is why I asked for the clarification order, I'm fine with the good faith representation of the applicant that they started with a workforce subdivision, it's still a workforce subdivision, but there's a conflict between conventional land divisions where you divide up a land area and these board members all know your typical subdivision is you've got a large parcel and you divide it into lots and you have individual driveways for each lot and you have an eternal buffer. Um, this, this standard, the board's gonna have to use its slight interpretive powers to say, how do these requirements line up with this particular type of project because this is all a single lot, and there are six units proposed. And how you apply these, you've got a great question, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. So, so if we're gonna take questions, it's got to be a measured, specific question to buffering strips. And sorry, you've got your hand up. So the, the question I asked is, how are we going to deal with automobiles? There's been no mention about automobiles, automobile pollution. How you handle that? Because if you have these six units, you're going to have between roughly 12 spots and you'll have guest spots. So how are you going to deal with that and how that fits with the plan, how it fits with the design, the environment? And you got the pollution issue. Yeah, that's going to come. We have a can, can, can you make it, can you make your question germane to the standard that's being reviewed right the now? The standard is. How are, buffer, you going to, buffering. how are you going to buffer 15 vehicles? There you go. That's a question. You don't, you don't address it at all. Yeah. And it's 15 vehicles that need to be buffered. So in the, in the buffering standard, we're tasked with reviewing buffering relative to outside storage areas, loading docks, storage tanks, garbage collection areas, electrical transformers, service areas, and similar functions. I, so, so it, just, one thing, I think the question about vehicles and traffic and that's going to come up later as we drill down through section five, not mm -hmm. to dismiss any questions, but in the context of buffering, um, I, I'm not seeing mention relative to vehicles. However, um, perhaps the applicant could just continue to talk about um so you can see please. mr chairman on tab 12 lining each one of the parking spaces to the exterior of the lot and that's that's what the standard the standard says along property lines to shield varying uses from each other first we got to consider we have varying uses um residential is residential um the cars and vehicles from the external you'll see is a dense line of um red twig dogwood shrubs and if you tap through the rendering which show the full encasement of the parking areas with those 
landscape features. I believe that would satisfy the first condition. A long property line to show varying uses and interior running roads. If you look at the interior running roads, you have one of the driveways. Dan, you were going to say something. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you guys expressed uh, some questions about um, 5.13. Uh, outside storage buffers. And I just want to point out that the, that the critical piece here is that um, uh, all of those things need to be screened from public view, which um, in, in each of these categories we're talking about um, public view, it's screening on the outside, not internal screening. Um, this is with a single lot, it's a condominium unit. And the key to 5.1, each of these sections, including the outside storage, loading docks, garbage collection areas, all of that needs to be screened from the public and everything that Mr. Johnson just talked about uh, effectively screens all of that from the public. Because you're primarily screening the perimeter of the lot with the buffering. With the buffering. There's all sorts of interior plantings and things like that, but for buffering beneath these requirements, um, mm -hmm. it's, it's buffering the exterior of the lot um, to, um, to the public. For my brain, in terms of sort of equivalence, I guess I've often thought of this because this is all one lot and it's condos kind of, so that it's somewhat similar to the COA's building that we reviewed mm -hmm. as a subdivision. That it was multiple living units all on one lot. They were all built into one building. Some of these were built into one building. Is that an accurate equivalent? I think it's similar to that. <clears throat> and what I heard in the description, and I've looked under tab 12, is I do think the board has evidence that goes to both standard one along property lines to shield various uses from each other. I don't quibble with whether it's another residential use. I think that's another use from their use uh, that's proposed. And then item three, as the chairman read, all outside storage areas, loading docks, um, I wish it was as specific as parking areas, but the, the gentleman's question from the audience is, are you screening vehicles? And when I go down to the renderings, I actually do see plantings designed to screen cars uh, as much as possible. Um, there is this balance that's been expressed by the project engineer be between being able to see above vegetation. There's one thing that really bugs motorists both on a public way as well as a driveway coming onto a public way, it's going to actually see other cars coming down the road versus, yeah, there's an effort with screening here. So I think both in terms of the standard that attorney Pelegi emphasizes in the plain text of the provision that the chair was speaking to, and in the evidence that you have from tab 12, it does address it. And I do think it's similar to what you were um, speaking to, Meredith, with the, the COA project. So, yeah. Thank you. Well, it, it just that I, then I'm thinking, so it's, it's really about around the edge, which seems to be mostly what they address, but if, if two units are physically built in, in the same, you can't screen them from each other. They're connected in the same building. So. Yeah, exactly. And so just a, maybe a mundane question with potential broader implications, but what are you doing with like trash cans and mm -hmm. all of that and and propane tanks or you know just all the the stuff we have to have in life or you can be all electric yeah so yeah. um <laughs> go first the one thing you didn't address was the storage and you see the storage for when it's going to be divided so they have interior storage and that was concerning where they're looking like they're not ready their stuff so the barn that's there is going to be purpose that storage you'll see is screened not only with the existing cedar vegetation line along the driveway that we, we talked about, the buckle of fence along that line, uh, screen by definition, fence fence does that. So I just wanted to point out that that uh, portion of the lights covered as far as storage. Um, we have approached um, Public Works Waste Department. I believe there's a letter, um, but similar to other neighborhoods, they would back in and do curb curb pickup to the interior. Um, 
we're not putting um, a lot of people do put it out on the public way. They would back in to the private way to um, get trash at the back of people's driveways, just like everybody else does on the public way, but the private way. Is everybody going to have their trash cans at the end of the drive? Their I mean, driveways or other? Make it really second, so. Yeah, or are there yeah. are there collection points for garbage? Like you're like you're buffering the garbage cans. We're not. No, no, we're not. Individ they're individual managing, uh, similar to how we should. Yeah. Mr. Mr. Burns. Chairman Lee, I was uh, uh, not expecting or hoping to have to uh, jump in for substantive revision here. Uh, but given that there's an ongoing back and forth between you and the applicant, I do feel the need to. Uh, Say my piece and put uh, materials in the record that uh, appear still to be open. Um, I would just note as this so uh, for one uh, interesting uh, admission that they're making regarding the trash pickup uh, that they're going to be undertaking, having them uh, go down this road essentially uh, within the subdivision to collect trash. If you calling it a driveway, I just want to note that that is not something that you generally see happen with a driveway. Um, but as to the bufferage question specifically, I, I would just point out um, that when we, we look to the eastern uh, border of the property, which does border uh, another uh, abutter, a uh, residential abutter, uh, and as I noted in my letter uh, back in June, the buffer that's being proposed here is uh, incomplete. Uh, the standard in your ordinance is an effective shielding between uses, and it's uh, clear from the plan put forward by the applicants themselves that the, the proposed buffer along that lot line is simply incomplete in places where it'd be relevant to have effective bufferage, including uh, for house four, where you have the uh, deck that's going to be kissing the applicable setback, you have uh, what is apparently proposed to be uh, an opening. So uh, to the extent that we're talking about effective bufferage, uh, that is simply not an effective buffer along the lot line. Um, and I, that was something that was noted to you uh, back in June. I would simply reiterate uh, that concern that the abutters uh, had raised uh, as the standard. Here. Yes, I would, I would submit that you can see the plan and along that property line and to allow for growth there's more than one, two, three, four, five, there's more than 10 trees of evergreens planted along that lot line. And we'll note that directly opposite there, there are, there's a presently vacant lot. I don't want to get into the debates of what a vacant lot uses, but I will submit that there's a number of planted evergreens, which we know that evergreens don't defoliate along that lot line. To the extent that the applicant trying to use the bufferage that may currently be on someone else's lot, uh, I would I would implore you to not consider the, what existing woods may may exist. On the I would not. We, we we should we should establish a practice here. We're getting into a back and forth between an applicant, which is fine. After a public hearing is closed, the board has the privilege. The applicant has the privilege of asking and answering questions. We're now getting into a back and forth between. Attorney Burns, um, whose clients have had the chance to speak during a public hearing. The public hearing is closed, as he noted earlier tonight, and now he's actually having an exchange with the project engineer. At a minimum, comments should be um, the subject of a raised hand and then a recognition by the chairman. We're, we're, gonna, we're gonna waste a lot of time in the future. We're almost out of time tonight, but I think we ought to have a ground rule as to how this section five review is going to work, because we're barely into the first standard and we're getting the back and forth between the attorney for the interested persons and the engineer. So what do you suggest? I suggest that um, there needs to be uh, a clear understanding as to whether and how you hear from members of the public, including counsel that represents them, because we're now into the stage where the board's doing its review. This is primarily for the board. Sometimes board needs clarification from applicants as to what they're proposing. I think this question of this open gap, as I look at the plan, isn't an open gap. There's a tree on the applicant's property already that exists. And so 
if the applicant can clarify briefly what that tree is. It looks like there's a round circle where there is no proposed green buffer. Is that round circle an existing tree on your property? There's an evergreen planted off the corner of the deck and off the other side is a, uh, I believe it's a maple, like a 12 inch maple. So you have two trees that are going to grow. Uh, I would say the board needs to look at the landscape plan and decide if there's been buffering provided between varying uses. And One thing I would encourage from experience is that if the Council for the interested party has a set of very specific written submittals on the standards. It's going to be a lot more efficient in the future to have a single letter to review as opposed to the back and forth. It's going to take five to 10 minutes each time we have the back and forth. Whereas a letter, you could just look at the letter and say, Attorney Burns has said he has a question about section 5.1. Mr. Hamilton, I just wanted to suggest that we, we've agreed to those timelines, to those letters, and then we just agreed to another timeline with another letter. So um, maybe yeah. in section to free open a record, which we've already asked for two separate deadlines on. That's the reservation. Yeah, I would be careful with requesting too many letters and bogging the process down. I mean, it's right yes, but what I've observed yes. with planning boards, particularly this board, is what you don't do in writing, you do orally, and you spend more time orally than you do in writing. So there's a balance to be struck at how you want to strike but, but this we're, you. But we're in the context of a public forum, so you know, I feel like some there's got to be some discussion. Right? So you, can yeah. I use the term measured? Uh, all right, and it's 901. Ding, 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 we're up. No. <laughs> Any last comment? Uh, my last comment would be if we have had discussion on at least 5.1 and have many more to go, is the board prepared to make a determination on compliance 5.1? Uh, if you're not prepared, fine. We're just asking you. You just spent 15 minutes on one criteria. We have several more. I just like to get a, a read from the board whether or not we're reviewed the buffer from 5.1 and we're prepared to make a decision on that section. Yep. From a due process perspective, you've heard from the parties. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I I feel like. I mean, I, the argument is it's one little hole next to a deck mm -hmm. at the front end of a lot. And <clears throat> I, they, I, to me, I feel like they've done a, an adequate job in pulling the criteria of the standard. Section 5.1. If they've got a buffering plan submitted as well as a planning plan. With descriptions of the plannings. And I, I feel like we've we've established that we're talking about buffering around around the outside of the lot. We're not talking about the separation between the units. And that the, the buffering criteria is relative to buffering to public view. Okay. Want to make I, a motion? I make a motion that they have what uh they are in compliance. They are in compliance with the requirements of uh, five point one, the buffer industry. So, for an exemplar purpose, if you're to make findings under each of these standards, you're going to want to say that the board determines that all requirements of section five one five point one have been satisfied. The chairman has read the requirements of section five point one into the record. So you could have, you could have revert to that reading of section 5.1 and just say the board uh, in response to the chair's review of the details of uh, section 5.1 finds that all requirements of 5.1 so that you have a specific finding on each one of these sections because the parties are going to be looking for that as part of any further review of your determination. Can I pretend that that I just look like you and I just said all that, or do I? Yeah, I'll, I'll just shorten it out. Um, 
in response to the chair's detailed reading yes. of the requirements of section 5.1, you would move as a board member that all the requirements read into the record have been met. Yes. So, I so move. Dave Ashmore, second. All right. All those in favor, Meredith? Randolph, aye. Dave? Dave Ashmore, aye. Tracy? Tracy Keller, aye. And myself, William Hanley, aye. There, we have one finding. <laughs> so don't underestimate the, the work and the exemplar you just created, because what the chair did is he reviewed it. He reviewed in detail every word and of that standard. We're going to go through each and every one of these. So things. once you've read it, then I think it makes a shorthand for the motion. In response to the chair's reading of the detailed requirements of that standard, I move that all the requirements of that standard are done. That's what we did. I'm just saying that's a good example. Mm -hmm. for Thank you. Good. That was the intent. You did it. Thank you. Thank all you right. for your help, Andy. So we have a, a date certain to which the hearing is being continued. Mm -hmm. We don't have any other other business, do we? That's the best of my knowledge. So I think we're we're at the point of adjournment. But we're not no. Are we adjourning the hearing or we're continu we continuing the public hearing but adjourning the meeting? Right. right. So we need a vote to adjourn the, yeah. the so hearing. To continue the public. To, well, we already did that. To, to continue compliance review to September 13th. Mm -hmm. I think they already voted on that. Yeah, we already voted on that. Okay. Yeah. You voted that that's what you were going to do. The word adjourn scared me a bit. So, yes, that, yeah. me too. I was like, we're not adjourning. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Didn't you say earlier that you ended the public meeting earlier? Yes. yes, we ended the public hearing, but this final, th this final flat plan review is being continued to a date certain, specifically September 13th. I'd be more comfortable if that motion is made and then a motion to return to you if that's possible. Okay, Meredith. I make a motion that we are continuing this meeting until to uh, September 13th. Um, and but we are adjourning this specific meeting. You can make it as a joint motion. Okay, so Tracy Keller, second. All right. All those in favor, Meredith? Randolph, aye. Tracy? Tracy Keller, aye. Dave? Dave Ashmore, aye. Myself, William Hanley, aye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, the public over you, you, you said earlier today that.